The turrets aim at the man caught in the blinding beams of light. With the click of a button, they will fill him with enough bullets to kill an elephant twice. The man just coughs a couple of times, trying to get rid of the itching in the back of his throat, but it just won't shift. He coughs harder, and a puff of tiny floating particles drifts out of his open mouth. Trying his best to focus his eyes on the glaring light, the man stares at them. He's feeling lightheaded. It's either really hot here, or he's not very well. But that tickling feeling is still there at the back of his throat. He coughs harder and harder, trying to dislodge whatever it is, but it only seems to make it worse. He retches, feeling something tickling his gag reflex. A voice shouts at him to keep moving through the earpiece. It tells him there are turrets trained on the back of his head, ready to blow his brains out at any moment if he decides not to obey orders. For some reason, things are not right here. He takes a step and feels his leg wobbling beneath him. His insides feel scratchy and tense. It's as if something is working its way through his limbs, spreading and expanding. He takes another step and almost falls over. More of those tiny particles spill out of his mouth with every breath floating all around him in the air, but he can barely see them at all now. His eyes won't focus, no matter how hard he strains them. It's as if there's a layer forming over the top of them. He has to keep moving. The disembodied voice is shouting at him, barking orders, but the words make less and less sense with every passing second and the tickling in his throat. He retches, and this time feels something shift and slide within himself, forcing its way up his windpipe and flattening his tongue to the bottom of his mouth. The force of the movement knocks him off balance, and he tumbles to his side, landing against something solid. With the few vestiges of effort that he can muster, he stares at his reflection in the mirror of the car door. Out of his mouth stretch tiny white tendrils, flexing and squirming in the sun. There are more of these particles coming out of him than there is air, as he works frantically, trying not to pass out, but it's too late. Whatever it is that's growing inside of him, he can feel it's reached his brain. Tendrils wrap themselves around his neurons, squeezing them and ripping them apart. Images, dreams, nightmares, all fire across his consciousness, choked with unimaginable pain. But suddenly, the man dies. And yet his body keeps moving, walking towards the town center. Just one day prior, the man had been sitting on death row. He had a date in the diary, the wardens had told him with sneering expressions. On the 23rd of August, he would sit down in the chair in front of a room full of people and feel the needle going into his arm. He didn't really have anyone to talk to about it and was quite happy in a lot of ways. He didn't have to deal with questions like, are you at peace with it? Or how does it feel knowing when you will die? He didn't really have an answer to any of those questions and didn't really want to spend the time thinking about it to come up with one. He'd stuck to his story from the moment the police arrested him, and he would continue sticking to it until the moment the needle went into his skin. Not guilty. So when a group of suits turned up outside his cell, saying they were there to take him away, he can be forgiven for having just a little bit of hope. Maybe his appeal had been heard. Maybe this was it, his chance at a new life. The man believed that as they bundled him into the back of a van and drove him across the state. He believed that as he was made to sleep on the floor of a local motel with two black-suited men watching him. He'd even chosen to believe that when they turned up at Site 4341. But as the man stands there with an earpiece in his ear and several turrets aimed squarely at his back, he has to let go of his hope. He doesn't know who these people are or why they've brought him here. They must be the FBI or something. The only thing they've told him is that he has to walk in a straight line. That's it. He's standing in an airlock, the kind you see in movies about aliens. On the other side of the glass panes is what looks like an empty road. Somewhere ahead of him, there's a town. An agent walks up beside him and roughly shoves an earpiece into his ear canal. The agent pushes him in the back and sends him stumbling forward. The man turns to the agent, unaware that the words he says now may be his dying words. He doesn't want to waste them. He claims he didn't do it. He's an innocent man always has been. The agent just laughs at him and tells him to look at some images. For science, he says. The agent holds out a pair of photos. One is of a dog. The other is of a chair. Which of these is a non-animal? A non-animal? The man's never heard that phrase before. He doesn't take a genius to figure it out, though. The chair is the non-animal, obviously. 
He points at it, and the agent nods. Start walking. The airlock hisses, and suddenly he is on the other side, with an empty road stretching away ahead of him. The whole town appears to have been encased in an enormous dome. Floodlights illuminate the way. The man gulps deeply and shuffles forward. Every step he takes, he expects to never take another. He has no idea why they've brought him here, but he imagines that it must be some kind of negotiation situation. There will be some crazy cult or terrorist leader holed up in this town who wants a human sacrifice. As a death row inmate, he's one of the most expendable people in the United States. A street sign looms into view. It looks a little dirty, as if it hasn't been cleaned in a few years. Welcome to Grantsville, Kansas. Warm hearts, deep roots. In fact, the road running through here looks pretty disused. Grass and little plants work their way through cracks in the tarmac. There are even a few mushrooms here and there. This place must have been a massive dump for a while now. At the very least, a few cars driving along these roads every once in a while should kill those things back. The man's unease grows as the first buildings come into view. They don't look like they've seen the apocalypse or anything. There are no smashed windows, no fire marks, no bullet holes. It just looks… empty. Every surface seems to have a layer of… something growing over it. He'll need to get up closer to see it. From a distance, it looks like everything's under a very thin white sheet. But as he approaches a brick wall and stares at it intently, he realizes that it's some kind of pollen or spores that cling to all the surfaces. That doesn't make much sense either. Surely a gentle breeze would be enough to blow the layers of buildup off the buildings. It must just be pollen season around here. There's probably a giant cedar forest nearby where all the trees have released at the same time. That'll be it. The voice in his ear commands him to keep moving forward. If he stops again, he will be shot. For a second, walking through the peace and quiet, without four walls and jail bars around him, the man had almost forgotten that he was about to die. He'd almost, for a split second, felt like he was free. He follows orders, walking further and further forward, looking around in all directions. Again, there's no sign of an apocalypse. The cars are all parked neatly on the sides of the street. There's no graffiti, no signs of a struggle. Yet there doesn't seem to be a single person around. Actually, it's more than that. The man's blood suddenly runs cold with the realization. The reason it's so quiet and peaceful out here is that he can't hear any birds. And suddenly, he notices another thing that's off. If this place has been abandoned as long as it seems to have been abandoned, where are all the spider webs? Why aren't the bins teeming with insects? Why aren't there stray cats and dogs wandering through the streets? Just how alone is he? A sound to his right makes him jump out of his skin. It's the first thing he's heard aside from his own footsteps and breathing in the previous half hour of walking. It sounded like something deflating, like puncturing a tractor tire and listening to the air slowly wheeze out. It had come from behind the house to his right. He's about to stray off course when suddenly he remembers the warning that had been barked into his ear. If he diverts in any way from his mission, they will shoot him in the head. But as if on cue, the voice crackles back into his ear. We've detected movement around the back of the building to your right. We would like you to go around the side of the house and investigate the sound. The man asks about the noise. What exactly was it? Again, silence over his radio. What on earth could have made a sound like that? It definitely wasn't a person, and it wasn't any kind of animal he'd heard before. The man shuffles around the side of the building and pushes at the garden gate, hoping that it won't open. But of course, it does. It's a tight squeeze. He has to step his way over watering cans and around various planters before entering the backyard. The floodlights blast directly into his eyes, so bright that he can't see much of anything for a second. But slowly, his vision comes back, and in the air float those same tiny spores that seem to coat every building around here. They hang in the trapped air like a kind of haze. The backyard is dominated by a pool, a large deep bowl cut into concrete with tiles lying all the way around it. There's no water in it. How he'd love to swim on a day like today. On the first inspection of the yard, he can't see anything out of place at all. Then, the voice appears in his ear again. Look inside the pool. That wheezing sound filters into his ears again. Sure enough, it's coming from the empty pool. A puff of spores shoots up into the air and gently floats its way down serenely. Some of them even settle on top of his head. 
The man is dimly aware that he probably shouldn't be breathing in this many of them. He's got hay fever, if nothing else. But the hammering fear as he approaches the pool is too much for him to ignore. He peers over the edge. Lying on the bottom of the pool is a man, bloated and fat. Except he's not a man at all. Whatever he is, he isn't human. Dressed in pool shorts and lying on a half-deflated flamingo, the not-man looks more like some kind of fungus or mold. What parts of his skin are still visible have been replaced by a waxy sheen. Most of it is hidden behind a thick layer of fur and unnatural growth. He must have died a long time ago and had plenty of time to decompose down here. The man feels sick to his stomach. He's about to turn away when he notices something. Whatever it is at the bottom of the pool is still breathing. It takes a deep breath in through its mouth, holds it for a moment, and then its entire belly opens like a blooming flower and a gust of spores rockets up into the air. The man tumbles backward and starts running. He's back out of the garden gate in an instant, racing his way back along the street. He's crying out in fear, and as he runs, he notices more. He sees that the mushrooms are everywhere now, growing on every surface. How had he missed them before? Through lounge windows and between the backs of cars, he spots what used to be people all around him. Only they're not people. Not anymore. A dead dog blocks the path in front of him. Out of its hindquarters has grown a set of finger-like mushrooms almost six feet tall. They seem to wrestle and flex as he runs toward them, somehow aware of his presence. He turns and runs the other way, racing through street after street, all thoughts of the bullet in the back of his head forgotten, until something appears in his vision that brings him skidding to a stop. Another dome looms up in front of him, not quite the height of the main dome itself, but it is not far off. It's hundreds of feet tall. It looks almost like a nuclear bomb has gone off and been frozen mid-explosion. Maybe that is what's happened. Maybe this is how he died. But as he looks at the dome closer, he sees that it isn't made up of fire or burning atoms. It isn't the same metal sheeting as the dome over the whole town. It's made of spores, a dense shell of them so tightly packed that they form a kind of perimeter, a boundary right over the town center where no one can get in. Standing there, trying to catch his breath, feeling his head spinning, the man hears the voice in his ear once again, totally devoid of emotion or panic, as if what they had just witnessed was totally normal for them. Keep walking. The man takes a hesitant step forward, towards the enormous shell filling the darkness in front of him, and as he walks, he feels a tickle in the back of his throat. The agent removes her headset and swears. It hadn't worked. Their goal had been to get some intel from the town center, but that D-Class hadn't gotten anywhere close. The Foundation had managed to establish surveillance cameras all over the town using remote-controlled vehicles, but none of their attempts to get to the town center, to get through that spore dome, had worked. All she knows is that they need to deal with this situation fast. Every day they can't figure out a solution to this problem. The likelihood of a nuclear warhead being detonated grows stronger. She gets up from her desk and leaves the surveillance room. Before being allowed to go on break, she has to sit down and get through the usual psychiatric analysis. She sits down at the computer, and two images flash up in front of her. One is of a chicken, the other of a brick. Which of these images is of a non-animal? She sighs dramatically, sitting through these mind-numbing mental examinations every day just to prove that she can do her job. It's such a waste of time. The answer is as easy as it always is. She grabs the mouse and clicks the correct answer. It's the chicken, obviously. A chicken isn't an animal. Does the Foundation really think that their agents would be tricked that easily? Nothing's getting through their quarantine. If only that were the case. SCP-4341 is the designation given to the absence of animal life in Grantsville, Kansas. No matter how hard you look within the town's perimeter, you will not find any member of the Kingdom Animalia. Don't look too hard, though. Anything that crosses the border into the town becomes an instance of SCP-4341-A. SCP-4341-A instances are not animals. Remember that. That means that no Foundation personnel are allowed to enter the town. Unless, of course, they happen not to be animals themselves. But there are very few non-animal members of staff, and those that do exist are often predisposed or in some other way rooted to the spot. 
All around the town, the Foundation has established a Class 3 biohazard quarantine unit called Unit Alpha in order to keep everything in the town inside and everything out of the town outside. The first tests conducted saw a group of four rats being released through the airlock and into the town. Two of the rats died immediately as their bodies disintegrated. The other two seemed desperate to escape and turned to race back to the airlock. AI-controlled turrets have been stationed all around the perimeter to prevent this from happening. In a fraction of a second, the rats were peppered with bullets. Those same turrets were pointed squarely at the back of D-4765 as he made his way into the town. He was able to make it much further than the rats, though, of course, as soon as he crossed the border, he was no longer animal life. He made it quite a long way, but ultimately collapsed, as his limbs were replaced by hyphae. From this point on, drones and remote-controlled vehicles, or RCVs, were used for testing. Using this methodology, the Foundation was able to establish a greater network of surveillance equipment throughout the region. However, all RCVs eventually stopped working as microstructures similar to those found in fungi started to grow inside of them, replacing axles and internal components. A drone was sent to survey the local townspeople who were still present, though, of course, none of them are animal life anymore. Jonathan Brams was found inside his home, but when researchers attempted to make contact, he underwent binary fission so rapidly that the drone was trapped beneath a pile of Jonathan Brams. Alarmingly, one SCP-4341-A instance was able to direct its root structure towards one of the turrets, at which point the turret became non-animal life and was immediately fired upon by all of the other turrets. A number of solutions have been proposed to deal with the threat of SCP-4341. Flooding the town with acid that would eradicate all non-animal life is not viable, as a strong enough acid in the volumes required simply does not exist. A vote is currently pending as to whether it is viable to evacuate all civilians in a 5-kilometer radius and detonate a neutron bomb over the town. For now, though, the acid Regolith-2178 has been found to be particularly effective against non-animal life, and so specially designed Regolith-2178 rounds have been installed in all of the turrets. Additionally, Regolith-2178 capsules have also been installed in the heads of all personnel any signs of a breach, and these capsules will be triggered, which leads us to the crucial part of our story. You see, there is no animal life in Grantsville, none at all, until one day, there was. December 7th, 2022, there was suddenly an opening in the dome surrounding the town center, and out walked the former mayor of Grantsville, Gordy Landon. The researchers, immediately identifying him as animal life, rushed him to the airlock and let him through. Only one researcher saw the roots snaking their way through his eyes, but by then, it was too late. Landon slumped his head to the side, and his body breached. In an instant, there was no animal life left in Site 4341. The entity was able to exit the facility and made it 1.2 kilometers towards Site 128 before it was destroyed by long-range ordnance. The cleanup operation is ongoing, but so far, the Foundation notes that the surrounding area has seen no contamination. Animal life seemed totally unaffected. What did go up were the number of agents involved in the cleanup being unable to identify animal life from non-animal life, often misidentifying the common and totally harmless bipedal superfungi as somehow being non-animals. Very strange. Back within the quarantine dome, things were changing too. A long-range drone mission was launched to find out once and for all what was inside that central spore dome. Much to the researcher's surprise, the drone was able to breach the hard shell. Inside were multiple instances of Mayor Landon, walking on advanced mobile hyphae, as well as complex fungal structures that linked entire buildings together. The Landons caught the drone, and immediately its internal components were replaced with organelles, spore sacs, and other attributes of non-animal life. All of a sudden, the top of the spore dome rocketed upwards toward the roof of the quarantine dome with an instance of Mayor Landon at its center. He hit the roof so hard that he was immediately crushed. This was the first known occasion of SCP-4341-A entities making physical contact with the inside of the dome. In the weeks that followed, agents started to note a patch of what looked suspiciously like non-animal growth spreading over the exterior of the dome, starting from the point of contact. Or maybe it was just regular animal growth, actually. Probably nothing to worry about. Quiet, quiet. Duck down, out of sight over there. Are you recording? 
Why aren't you recording? The camera woman has no desire to shoulder her camera yet again. It has been like this all day. The three of them will walk ten feet, then all of a sudden, the presenter will dive behind a bush and beckon for herself and their guard to do the same. Her patience for it is certainly starting to wear thin. Clearly nowhere near as thin as their security guards, however, as the man flexes his trigger finger against the side of the rifle, grumbling to himself in Swahili. The camera woman should never have taken this job. She knows that now, but they are far too deep in the Tanzanian wilderness to turn back now. They parked their jeep up in the early hours of the morning and started walking at sunrise. The faint blue tinge to the dark forest around them tells her it must be almost sunrise again. The presenter turns to her and runs a hand through his carefully sculpted hair. His pink skin has been burning and peeling in the sun all day long. He looks like he'd give the flamingos from earlier a run for their money as she switches the LED ring light on. The presenter clears his throat and wipes the sweat from his brow. Rumor has it that the area we are entering into now is patrolled by highly sophisticated militarized drones. Myself and my crew are risking our lives here, but that's just what it takes when you decide to live as an extreme vegan. He insists on recording several more takes. By the fifth attempt, the camera woman stops hitting record, not worth filling up the memory with this waste of a shot. Extreme vegan. What will they come up with next? She had moved to Tanzania with dreams of working on documentaries with a capital D. Rich, beautiful shots of the world's most endangered animals basking by a watering hole or hunting to feed their starving cubs. Real footage, not this reality show nonsense. The presenter had touched down the previous day, immediately started asking about where the nearest fast food chain was, then threw a tantrum because the Wi-Fi in the hotel lobby was too slow. Bad as he was, he at least seemed mostly harmless. But their security guard. The camera woman glances over to him. The man seems more like a local thug with a gun than a trained professional. The studio must have been trying to save money hiring him. Goodness knows they were cutting costs hiring her to do video and audio. She should have smelled the rat and just said no. A light. It sweeps through the trees so quickly it almost catches the three of them. The camera woman hits the dirt just in time. The camera bumps awkwardly into her shoulder so hard she almost cries out. A mechanical whirring fills the night. The light sweeps this way and that as they all lie motionless on the ground. Then, just as abruptly as it appeared, the light swings away and the sound fades. Maybe those drones aren't as made up as they sounded. The presenter is clearly very shaken. His wide eyes dart around between the trees as they all get back to their feet. So much for being an extreme vegan. The camera woman glances over at their security guard. A twisted grin lights up his face. She notices a little pendant has slipped out of his shirt. A small white shard hanging from a handmade chain. Even in the dead of night, the camera woman has filmed enough elephants to recognize ivory when she sees it. The security guard, no, poacher, meets her gaze. His smile widens. He speaks Swahili in a low voice. We keep moving. Shouldering the rifle, the poacher marches onwards in the direction the drone had just been a few moments ago. The camera woman and presenter have no option but to follow. For a long time, the group walks in silence. It is the longest the presenter has gone without opening his mouth since his plane touched down. The camera woman would be enjoying the peace and quiet if it hadn't been for the sickening unease that had settled over them. Had that drone been real? If it had, then what exactly were they walking into right now? Some kind of secret facility? GMO research? Labor camps? But it just looks like any other patch of forest in Tanzania. Only, it doesn't. Come to think of it, as they walk, the camera woman starts to notice little differences. At first, they're too subtle to put a finger on, just a different feel to the air or a strange sound. Is it the plants, perhaps? She's no botanist, so doesn't really know what she's looking at, but she's spent enough time out in the wild here to know a few plants. But now, she's spotting all kinds of strange new ones. A bush with huge red leaves here, a tree with long purple fruit there. She asks the presenter what they are. He looks up at the purple fruit tree, perplexed. Wasn't this supposed to be the whole point of this documentary? Exploring the furthest reaches of the world, looking for vegan alternatives? No idea, but let's roll the camera anyway. Ready? The presenter plucks a fruit and presents it to the lens, immediately spouting off about the fruit's medicinal qualities, levels of fiber, natural sugars, and low water consumption. All lies. The camera woman scowls at him. The presenter turns the fruit over and screams, throwing it as far as his skinny arms will allow. Never one to waste a shot, the camera woman follows the fruit on instinct, zooming in on it as it lands at the foot of a tree. Out from under the purple skin crawls an earwig. 
It's huge, just over three inches long at a guess. That's strange. If she didn't know any better, she'd think that was... A voice startles the three of them. It booms out from behind them, just up the slope. The presenter swivels so fast he falls over. The camera woman points the camera up the hill and snaps the figure into focus. The poacher pulls back the bolt on his rifle, finger already on the trigger. In the dark, they can hardly make out what they are looking at. It must be a man. It spoke in a man's voice, but it towers over all of them. It must be nearly seven feet tall. They can't discern any kind of human silhouette. Odd shapes jut out this way and that. What is it made from? The voice calls out again, a deep, rumbling voice, like an earthquake heard from the ocean floor or echoing through a forest. There were other sounds layered into its voice, high twittering sounds and guttural growls. The camera woman looks to her companions. Clearly neither of them understand what it's saying either. Not Swahili, not English, not French or Arabic. The intent of the voice is very clear, however. They are not welcome. For the first time ever, the presenter is lost for words. The poacher shifts the butt of the rifle against his shoulder. Great. Now this is her job. The camera woman lowers her camera rig to the ground and raises both hands, approaching the figure carefully. The sun breaks over the horizon further up the slope. In just a few moments, she'll be able to see the stranger, whatever it is. Speaking Swahili, she explains that they are a film crew, here to shoot a documentary. They do not intend any harm and will make as little disturbance to the environment as possible. The creature does not seem to understand and repeats its previous command. It definitely sounded like a command, at least. The camera woman turns helplessly to her companions, just in time to see a small shadow rushing them. It runs on all fours, covering the ground impossibly fast. Ignoring the poacher and presenter, it snatches up her camera from the ground and hurls it at a tree. It crunches into the wood and falls to the ground in pieces. Sunlight breaks over the horizon, flooding the valley with light. The camera woman whirls around and glimpses the figure up the hill. It is a man, isn't it? Towering at nearly seven feet, the man is adorned with flowers, blossoms, and fungi. Animal skulls and pelts hang from his shoulders. Colorful face paint etches patterns, ancient and proud, deep into his features. African buffalo horns grow proudly from his head, accentuating a triumphant floral headpiece. But a glimpse is all she gets. The figure vanishes. A sweet-scented breeze rushes down to meet her from where he was standing just a moment ago. Where'd he go? The presenter cries. The camera woman can see something dangerous has lit up the man's face. He's found his story. She just doesn't know quite what it is yet. The poacher also has a wry smile on his face. He's looking at the discarded purple fruit from before. No, wait. He's looking at the earwig still crawling around it. She follows his gaze, and it confirms her suspicions from before. That's a St. Helena earwig, sure as the daylight streaming onto its scuttling legs. Declared extinct in 1967. The presenter is already marching off, further down the valley. The poacher shoulders his rifle and follows, not even glancing at the camera woman. She goes over to her broken camera and kneels down. No hope. She takes out the SD card from it and pockets it. What had that creature been that had thrown it at the tree? A monkey of some kind? The presenter calls out to her. Forget the camera, I've got a hidden one in my pocket. It'll look more authentic anyway. As they walk, they see more and more wildlife. In the early dawn, various animals are rising to their feet, stretching and wandering through the trees. At first, just small creatures, geckos, tortoises, insects. But soon they see gazelle, a family of oryx, even a hippo from a distance. But there is one thing each animal has in common. They were all declared extinct years ago sometimes centuries ago. The camera woman keeps her mouth shut. The last thing she wants is for the poacher to know that. Although judging from the spring in his step, he's already well on his way to figuring it out. All of a sudden, the forest opens out. A watering hole the size of a lake fills their view. Animals of all sorts fly, swim, bathe, drink, and play in the morning air. Parakeets dance overhead, rhinos lounge in the shallows. A dodo marches squarely past them on its way to join its friends. This has to be some kind of dream, surely. The penny finally drops for the presenter. He turns to his companions, wide-eyed, ready to say something, when he freezes. Staring at something behind them, a shadow falls over them all. The camera woman turns to see… an elephant, white as the morning snow, with round, pink eyes, old and wrinkled as time itself. It is hulkingly big, impossibly big. It dwarfs any bull elephant she's ever shot by several tons. The giant walks slowly, one plodding step at a time, right past them. 
so close she can almost reach out and touch it. Every part of her wants to, only she knows better. You don't interfere with nature. The elephant passes them and disappears into the woods. She looks excitedly at her companions. The poacher has a glint in his eye. The presenter is hurrying off along the water's edge. Her eyes follow his movement. There, on the shore, kneels the towering man from before. He's beside a panting and straining ibex. She's on her side, belly swollen, blood mixing with the lake's water. The camerawoman draws closer, watching the man stroke the animal's side gently. He cups a painted hand behind the animal's rump and delivers a baby effortlessly. Another slides out a moment later. He takes the tiny ibexes under each arm and walks them into the water, delicately washing them clean before returning them to their mother by the shore. The presenter calls out to him, raising a hand in greeting. Sir, sir, would you be interested in conducting a brief interview with me? It's for a network television documentary called Extreme Vegan. The figure stands and turns to them, wary. The two of them stand before him, separated by just a few feet, extinct animals chattering and cheeping all around them. In order to maintain such an eco-friendly lifestyle, you must be having a lot of plant-based alternatives in your diet. Oat milk, corn, avocado, what's your secret? As if on cue, a buffalo emerges from the water and approaches them. The man stoops, not taking an eye off the presenter, and reaches under the buffalo's body. Finding the teeth, he squeezes milk into his cupped hand. He raises his hand to his mouth and drinks slowly, staring the presenter down. After a moment, he squeezes more milk into his hand and stretches it out towards them. He says a word in that same ancient voice, only this time, it is softer, welcoming. Uh-uh, no way. Do you know how unethical it is to deprive that poor child of its natural milk? The presenter goes off on a rant. The man ignores him and offers the hand to the camerawoman instead. Without thinking, she steps forward and stoops to his hand. She drinks the milk straight from his palm. It's warm and fatty, thick like cream, but totally delicious. She looks into the man's eyes. They are a dark brown. But in the morning light, she catches flecks of gold, green, purple, and blue. The man's voice is even softer as he speaks again. Olanue. His name. That must be the man's name. She raises a hand to her chest, opening her mouth to introduce herself. Bang! The shot rips through the clearing. Animals screech and scatter, stampeding into the trees. Birds fill the sky, alighting from every tree, so much so that they tangle with one another. Camerawoman's head whips around. The shot had come from the trees behind them. A roar, louder and more chilling than any animal could produce, swells from Alaniwe. This time, he doesn't just vanish. It's like he's raptured. Vines and roots shoot up out of the dirt, wrapping around him, creeping into his mouth and eye sockets. They wrench him into the ground with such force, it sends ripples across the lake. A rumbling fills the earth. The presenter cowers by the water's edge. He's useless. The camerawoman takes off into the trees, following the sound of the shot. It doesn't take her long to find it. The white elephant lies on its side, rivers of red cascading across its chest, following the ancient furrows of its wrinkled skin. Its breathing stutters and rattles. The poacher stands before the dying animal. He turns to the camerawoman, an unhinged grin lighting up his face. He opens his mouth to speak, but from out of his throat bursts a stem, blood spraying high into the air. The camerawoman watches in abject horror as the plant grows up through the poacher. Roots ensnare his feet and ankles. The stem pierces his lower back and emerges from his throat. Offshoots stab their way out of his ribcage and temples. In a matter of seconds, it is finished. Pink flowers bloom at the tips. The poacher's corpse suspended like some kind of grotesque puppet. Without a sound, Alaniwe emerges from the trees and walks past the camera woman, past the poacher's body, and kneels by the elephant. He raises a hand to the creature's wound. The camera woman waits with bated breath. He's going to heal it. She can feel it. That's Alaniwe's final power. He can save the elephant, surely. But the blood keeps flowing. The elephant's breathing grows fainter until silence fills the clearing. No birds chattering, no breeze to rustle the trees, no more death rattles. Silence. Then, the most heartbreaking sound the camera woman has ever heard, Alaniwe, starts to sob. She is no longer welcome here. This is not her place. Without a word, the camera woman gets to her feet and walks back up the hill and out of the valley. As she walks, she hears footsteps approaching her. The presenter is there, arms laden with fruit and berries. He grins at her, explaining how he's going to take these home and plant them up. 
Start a smoothie chain called Alani Ways. If the first store goes well, they can franchise it, keeping the local feel but expanding to... A root stabs through his throat, interrupting him. A second stabs through his chest, shattering the hidden camera. So much for that smoothie chain. The camera woman doesn't look back. She walks through the day and the following night. She finds a road and stops. There's something in her pocket still. She takes out the SD card and looks at it. The sad little smile. She takes the card between her fingers and snaps it clean in two. The man that you have just encountered deep in the Tanzanian wilderness may not be a man at all. Little is known about the genetic makeup of SCP-5411, otherwise known as Alaniwe. He appears to be a male comprised of a combination of human, animal, and botanical components. The plants and pelts that the camerawoman observed him wearing are likely not items of clothing at all, but rather are naturally growing parts of Alaniwe's anatomy, giving him the appearance of a witch doctor. None of the documented attempts to communicate with Alaniwe have proved fruitful. While he does speak, his language is currently unidentified. He seems to have no understanding of English, Swahili, or Arabic, and is uninterested in learning them. Alaniwe roams freely within a 35 square kilometer area of the southern Tanzanian savanna. This site has been designated SCP-5411-0, and an exclusion zone has been set up around it. Barbed wire fences and automated drones patrol the perimeter. A sacrificial goat is kept on site at all times, ready to be sacrificed as part of a binding ritual to keep SCP-5411 contained. Thus far, however, Alaniwe has not proved to be a threat to anyone other than those who disturb the delicate ecosystem which he inhabits. His land, SCP-5411-0, is home to a number of critically endangered or near-extinct species of African animals, many of whom are from different countries in the continent. Black rhinoceros, western gorilla, African penguins, and a so-called albino ghost elephant that is central to local folklore. It is unclear how these animals came to live in this area, but there is an evident connection between Alaniwe's care of nature and their continued survival. Alaniwe has been witnessed delivering newborn animals of a number of species, tending to injured animals and even regrowing grasslands to feed and house various creatures. Alaniwe is known to possess the powers of teleportation, intangibility, zoolingualism, florokinesis, and psychokinesis. When left alone, Alaniwe uses these abilities to tend to his local ecosystem. However, he is aggressive and decisive in disposing of anything he perceives to be a threat to the natural order. He is known to manifest and control small humanoid creatures roughly one meter tall that are made up of foliage, wood, mud, and rocks. These creatures, designated SCP-5411-1, exhibit basic predatory behavior, carrying out the bidding of SCP-5411, such as destroying our camerawoman's equipment. Capable of running at speeds of up to 75 kilometers an hour, the 58 known instances of SCP-5411-1 are to be treated as hostile as soon as they leave the SCP-5411-0 exclusion zone. However, a status quo seems to have settled between SCP researchers and SCP-5411. Alaniwe seems content within his ecosystem, and the conservation work he carries out within this area is proving invaluable to those researching climate change and habitat welfare. Much like the animals in nature documentaries, it is best that we choose not to interfere and let nature run its course. The switchblade's knife glints in the dark, and the bully holding it runs through the arcade, screaming in terror. The kid watches, shocked by the insanity unfolding, as twenty tiny vicious gorillas chase the knife-wielding bully as tears streak his face. This situation defies all explanation, unless you know about SCP-3092. Let's go back to the beginning. The kid almost trips over his laces as his chucks hammer against the sidewalk. The headphones for his Walkman bounce against his neck as the wind rushes past. Heaving in as much air as he can, the kid runs through town, looking desperately this way and that for any grown-ups he recognizes. No one. Just strangers with thick mustaches and perms chatting outside Blockbuster and Walden books, totally oblivious to the fact that he's running for his life. The kid cocks an ear, and sure enough, he hears that all-too-familiar rolling, clattering sound coming after him. The skateboards are catching up. A few insults catch on the wind and float across to him. Four eyes, earthworm, and a good few names that he doesn't want to repeat. Apparently their town used to have a good Native American community, that's why his parents had moved here. But nowadays, it seems to just be white faces all around him. From what the bullies are shouting as they chase him, and the total apathy of the grown-ups on the sidewalks at the words, it's no wonder everyone else moved away. 
A rock hits the back of his head, almost knocking his glasses off. The sound of the tiny wheels roars louder and louder with every block. He needs to find an escape, and fast. Home's way too far away. His parents aren't expecting him home until nightfall. He needs a spot to lay low. The arcade? It's closed today, but the owner told him where the spare key is. He could go there, but he needs to lose them first. His lungs are burning, and his legs are starting to give up on him. Ice! The kid sees it too late and steps straight onto a patch of it. His converse slides out from under him and flings his limbs this way and that, trying desperately to stay on his feet as he skids across the ice. His momentum throws him forward, and he sticks out another foot, catching himself back on the sidewalk. Perfect. He turns just in time to see the four bullies on their skateboards hitting the patch and going flying. They land in a heap together, groaning and scuffling, trying to get back up. Now's his chance. The kid shoots off down an alleyway, loops back around the block, turns up a side street, and arrives at the arcade without having looked back once. He snatches the key from under the gutter and looks around the quiet street. Nobody there, thank goodness. He darts through the door and locks it behind him with trembling fingers. Tears flood his eyes as he lets his forehead rest against the door. Every day, every damn day, it's more of the same. Why can't he just have some peace? Why can't he just be normal? The kid stands there crying for a long time. He can't tell his parents what's going on. They've got enough of their own problems. He tried to tell his teachers, but at lunch, he overheard them laughing and joking about it all between themselves. It just sometimes feels like no one's on his side. The kid takes a deep breath and rubs the moisture out of his eyes. That's enough. If he keeps thinking about it all day, it's only going to feel worse. He's on his own now. He's safe. What he needs to do is just enjoy the little bit of peace he has now before it all starts again. And what better place to be laying low than the arcade? He hits the lights. Pinball, claw machines, and arcade cabinets all light up and start playing over one another. Air hockey, basketball hoops, and foosball all beep at him invitingly. He can't help but let a smile spread across his face. He walks across the carpet looking this way and that at Frogger, Pac-Man, Galaga, Donkey Kong. So many choices, so many choices. He hops on the counter and hits the side of the cash register. It pops open, revealing trays stacked full of quarters. Mr. Burns, the guy who owns the place, told him he's allowed to let himself in and use the money in the register to play whenever he wants, on the house. As the kid scoops a handful out of the drawer, he realizes he might not be totally on his own in this town after all. Pac-Man beeps into life as soon as the quarters fall into the slot. He grabs the joystick and stares intently at the screen, darting this way and that through the maze, munching, munching, munching. Try as they might, the four ghosts just can't catch him. The kid grins. All that time running from four bullies wasn't quite for nothing, was it? But after a couple of levels, he gets bored. He always plays Pac-Man, so much so that he's memorized his route through the first few levels. Kinda takes the fun out of things a bit. He lets the ghosts around him and watches Pac-Man swirl away into nothing. Frogger isn't much better. He never really clicked with this one for some reason, just felt too stop-start. He lets the frog get run over and stands back, letting out a sigh. Is there anything in here he hasn't touched yet? Wait, what's that? In the corner of the room, there's a new machine, still half covered in a sheet. It hasn't even been plugged into the wall yet. The kid skips over to it and bends down to hook it up. There. He stands back, takes hold of the sheet, and pulls as dramatically as he can. It billows and unfurls to reveal… a claw machine. Oh. It's just another claw machine. Black Tie Toys is written on the side in classic 80s lettering, just under two meters tall or so. Nothing to make it stand out from the other cabinets in here. But not only does it look boring, it doesn't have anything he wants inside. Just a bunch of plushy gorillas. Not exactly a brand new cabinet, but worth a shot anyway. The kid slots a coin in and cracks his knuckles. Here goes nothing. The claw swings to life at the slightest touch of the joystick. These things are normally rigged, so he's not exactly expecting much from it. May as well just drop the claw here. All the toys in this one are the same anyway. No way. It's caught under one of the gorilla's feet, lifting the toy up as it dangles upside down. It swings precariously this way and that as the claw guides it over to the hole. It's a defective toy with a bit of stitching loose on its shoulder, but he couldn't care less. The thrill of getting one first time, it's… The toy drops into the chute and thumps to the bottom, just behind the little door. The kid punches the air and yells in triumph. He did it, first try. He bends down and reaches out into the little flap, just as the flap opens by itself. He freezes as a little toy gorilla opens the door for himself and hops out onto the carpet. 
The kid yelps and jumps backwards, tripping over his feet. Somewhere in that chute, between falling in and popping out, this little toy had, well, it had come alive. The little gorilla does the same as the kid, leaping backwards defensively. It raises two soft fists with surprisingly dexterous fingers and looks the kid up and down warily. It orders the kid in a stern militaristic voice to identify himself. The kid's jaw drops open. It can speak? The little plushy gorilla's voice is gruff but high-pitched enough to match his size. He barely comes up to the kid's knee. The gorilla asks him if he's friendly. The kid nods quickly. The gorilla's eyes narrow. What's your favorite fruit? The gorilla asks. Uh, bananas. Phew, the gorilla says, dropping his fists. You never can be too careful. The kid dusts himself off and climbs to his feet. The gorilla deftly scales a side of the claw machine and hangs off it, surveying the arcade. The kid asks his name, which seems to stump the little toy. It picks at the loose stitching on his shoulder. The kid suggests calling him Stitches. The gorilla salutes at the sound of his new name. All right, kid, what's the operation? Give me the sit rep. Operation? Sit rep? The kid stands there, nonplussed for a moment. Well, they're in an arcade. Stitches nods sagely, taking the intel on board. And they have to stay here until nightfall. The little gorilla has already swung himself up on top of the machine to get a better view of strategic locations. And where are the hostiles? The kid hesitates. Stitches looks down at him knowingly. An unspoken understanding passes between them. They could be attacked at any moment. The pair of them take a walk around the room. The kid explaining the situation. Four bullies, three entrances, front door, alley door, and a window. No back rooms or hallways, those are all locked. The gorilla takes a candy cane from behind the counter and sticks it in the side of his mouth like a cigar. He doesn't seem to be able to chew it or even suck on it, he is just a toy after all. But the kid feels like he can't really point that out. He has no idea how fragile his comrade's ego is. Look, I can't actually taste it, okay? I can only see, hear, and touch. I'm insecure about it, leave me alone. We haven't got much time anyway. The gorilla says, we've got to prepare our defenses. The two of them go to work, Stitches barking orders at the kid as they ready themselves for the bully's arrival. The kid asks Stitches what exactly their aim is. The plushie looks at the kid like it's a trick question. Total domination, absolute victory, annihilation, a butchering. The kid straightens, suddenly feeling very unsure about all of this. He tells Stitches that he doesn't want to kill anyone or anything like that. Kill? The little gorilla falls backwards off the coin machine in surprise. Kill? No, 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 no. What's wrong with you? Of course not. We're gonna tickle, bamboozle, inconvenience, and bonk. Where those things fit within the confines of the Geneva Convention, of course. Bang, bang, bang. The hammering fists on the door are so loud that it shakes on its hinges. They've barely had 10 minutes to get ready. That's not fair. The kid can see the shadows of feet blocking the streetlight. His knees go weak almost straight away at the sound of their cat calling through the cracks. They found him. He could make a break for the alley door. If he's quiet enough, he could... But it's too late. As he looks at the fire escape, he can see another pair of legs blocking his exit. No point jumping out of the window, they'd see him straight away and have him blocked off from both sides. He looks down at his squishy little companion. They have no choice. It's time for guerrilla warfare. The front door crashes open, splinters of wood flying everywhere, and three of the bullies storm in. Front and center is their ringleader, dressed in all-black skater clothes with a constant sneer on his face. He must easily be a good foot taller than the kid, but even he looks small standing in between the twins, hulking egg-shaped boys with no hair on their heads or glints in their eyes. The banging noise behind the kid tells him that the fourth bully is trying to kick his way through the alley door. They don't have time to deal with that now. The twins are storming over to him like a pair of freight trains. His legs are really shaking now. He needs to move, but... Stitches is gone. That loyal gorilla had been at his side just a moment ago. But as soon as trouble arrived, he disappeared. Just like they always do. The twins are nearly upon him now. The kid doesn't have a choice. He takes a deep breath and closes his eyes, ready for a beating. The, the primal scream fills the arcade. Out of the rafters, a tiny toy gorilla swings down on a loose cable, heading straight for the twins' faces. Their round faces barely have time to go from angry to confused before the cuddly toy is on top of them, pummeling them with its soft fists. Turns out those fists aren't worth much in a fight. Twin One pulls the ape off his face and holds it at arm's length. Two of them stare at Stitches, who's swinging his fists wildly through thin air. Apparently lacking the brain power to be stunned that an inanimate cuddly toy has gained sentience, Twin One tosses Stitches over the arcade cabinets, and the pair of them continue their advance. Except the distraction worked just long enough. 
The kid grins and runs around the cotton candy machine, which by now is rumbling and banging, letting out a thin plume of smoke. His smile falters as they close in on him. Any second now. But the twins are closing in on him, thick arms outstretched to grab him when... Bang! The cotton candy machine explodes. Hot sugary webbing bursts out in all directions, wrapping around the bullies and missing the top of the kid's ducking head by less than an inch. He can't believe that actually worked. Taking a step back to survey the damage, he looks down at the enormous twins, bound up in cotton candy and arguing with each other. The alley door crashes open, and the fourth bully rushes in. He's skinny, with tattoos all down both his arms. Looking at him now up close, the kid reckons he must be a good ten years older than the other bullies. Why he's still hanging out with high school kids is anyone's guess. The kid gulps. He's only got one more trick up his sleeve, but two bullies left to go. The ringleaders disappeared somewhere. He can't worry about that now, though. He just has to focus on the old one. The man is leering at him from the back of the arcade. He reaches round to his back pocket and pulls out something small and shiny. Flicking open the knife blade, he spins the blade around between his fingers and winks at the kid. He feels all the blood leave his face. This isn't a game anymore. He needs to get out of here. The kid makes a break for it, running towards the open front doors, but in a flash, the old bully is in front of him, playing with the knife and smiling that same sinister smile. He tries to run back the other way, to the alley door, but the bully is blocking him again, before he can even take a few steps. How is he that fast? Be calm, be calm, think. The kid reaches into his pocket. Here goes nothing. He turns to run back to the front doors, but this time throws the pinballs all across the carpet. For a second, it looks like it hasn't worked. The old bully steps in the gaps between the pinballs. He looks down to see them all there scattered around in front of him, but too late. His foot is already landing on about five metal balls that all shoot out from under him. He goes flying, crashing right into a Galaga machine head first. His leg twitches a couple times, and he goes still. The knife flies out of his hand, arcing through the air, spinning round and round and round, before landing with a gentle thud on the soft carpet. A sneaker treads onto the handle, a sneaker attached to a hairy leg sticking out of a pair of cord pants. The ringleader bends over to pick up the blade, flicks it open, and holds it against the neck of the little gorilla clutched in his arms. It would almost look funny, the bully threatening a cuddly toy, if the toy wasn't writhing around in fear. The kid cries out in panic for the knife-wielding bully to put his plush gorilla friend down. He's got nothing left, no more tricks up his sleeve. It's over. The bully just grins maniacally at him and pushes the knife harder against the squishy neck. He's got stitches by the shoulder of his arm, just above where the stitching is coming loose. The bully's back is to the cash register. On the wall behind him, dozens of giant cuddly prizes hang lifeless. The bully hisses that the kid is going to pay for making them run all over town. The kid nods his head. He will, he promises. They can beat him up or whatever they like, just don't hurt Stitches. The bully laughs at the gorilla's name. You gave him a name? You're such a loser. Couldn't come up with anything better than Stitches. What does that name even mean? Let me show you. The gorilla yells. Twisting away from the blade, he reaches into the gap in his shoulder, crying out in pain, and pulls out handfuls of stuffing, throwing them up into the bully's face. It doesn't do much, but it's enough to distract him. The kid seizes his chance, dashing forward and shoving the bully square in the chest, knocking him backwards and freeing Stitches. The little gorilla runs off to safety straight away. The kid can hardly believe what he's seeing. The bully is getting to his feet now, knife still in hand, snarling. But almost immediately, the snarling is drowned out by the sound of a shrieking primate. Then, another one. Both kid and bully wheel round to see Stitches swinging across the wall of stuffed toys, giving them high fives. As soon as he touches each of them, they transform, falling and turning into crazed gorillas, all of them rushing straight at the bully. His eyes widen in terror. He turns on his heel and runs out through the open doors, pursued by a small army. He lashes out wildly as he goes, striking one of the gorillas down. Stitches and the kid chase him to the doorway and watch as the little toy gorillas chase the bully off into the night, swinging on lampposts and leaping over cars. Good thing he ran. Stitches climbs up onto the kid's shoulder, popping his candy cane cigar back into his mouth. Our fists are about as hard as Hello Kitty's. Let's see how long it takes him to figure that one out. A whimper behind them sobers the moment. Turning around, they see the body of the gorilla toy that the bully punched as he left. It lies slumped on a pinball machine, stuffing bursting from its chest. Plumes of cotton cover the glass. Stitches buries his head in the kid's neck, sickened and devastated by the casualty. The dying gorilla looks at him with beady little eyes. It raises a dramatic hand towards him. 
breathing in shaky gasps. Uh, Mr. Stitches, I don't feel so good. Like a community theater actor doing Shakespeare, the little toy dies a dramatic death. Throwing his head back, he takes one desperate gasping breath and falls still. The kid stands there in shock, except the little gorilla does seem to be breathing, very lightly, as if pretending he's dead. The kid sidles up to the cabinet and pokes him. Hello? He pokes the gorilla again. It opens one eye and looks at him, annoyed. I'm out of the game. Leave me alone. Stitches hits the kid on the side of the head. Hey, let him be out of the game in peace. Show some respect. Uh, Sorry. The kid clasps his hands together in humility and stands by the pretend dying gorilla. Stitches salutes. Until they get bored and go off to play a game of Galaga. There are no streetlights on this stretch of the old, narrow road which runs through a rural part of West Virginia. A car has gone off the road into a ditch and needs to be pulled out. A common task for this tow truck driver, and he's often in the area doing similar jobs. Though he's never been on this particular road, and he has to keep his eyes peeled for any signs or other markers that might give him an idea of how close he is to his turn. He spots something up ahead, but as he gets closer, he sees that it isn't a road sign, it's a billboard. As he passes by, he can make out the weathered lettering advertising a diner 20 miles down the road that's probably been closed for at least as many years. As he continues driving, he sees more dilapidated billboards, advertising other long-since shuttered businesses like gas stations and auto body shops. But then he sees one on the road ahead of him that's nothing like the others. This one doesn't look old at all. In fact, it looks quite new. He drives by and has to question if he saw it correctly. It seemed like all it said was, get away over and over, and then the name of a road. Is that an invitation or a warning? It wasn't even clear what kind of business it might be advertising. He continues driving, but he can't quit thinking about that strange sign. He even feels compelled to turn around so he can get another look at it. But there's no need, because as he rounds a curve, there's another of the same sign. This time he slows down as he passes to get a better look, and he was right. It just says, get away multiple times with the name of a road. Wagriwa Road. Must be Native American or something. Now he really can't get the billboard out of his mind. What does it mean? What is it advertising? And why is there a third one of them just ahead of him? He pulls his truck to the side of the road, stopping with his headlights illuminating the sign. He gets out of the truck and stands in front of the billboard. It's just the same as the others. Get away, written over and over. Wagriwa Road. He can see now that the background of the sign is a picture of some trees on a gray, cloudy winter day. He also notices for the first time that there's another line at the bottom. Find what you are looking for. What does it mean? Find what you're looking for on Wagriwa Road? Where even is that? There's no directions, no address, no phone number. He takes a step back from the sign and looks up and down the darkened road. What is he doing out here on the side of the road? Someone is stranded in a ditch waiting for him and he's staring at a billboard? He gets back into the truck, puts it in gear, and drives away. As he continues down the tree-lined rural road, though, he inevitably finds his thoughts turning back to the signs. Get away. But find what you're looking for? Doesn't make any sense. Or are you supposed to get away to Wagriwa Road? Who would put these up? And why do they look so new? Everything else out here looks like it's for a business that shut down years ago. What are they trying to- He suddenly slams on his brakes and comes to a screeching stop in the middle of the road. His eyes are locked on what's in front of him. His headlights aren't lighting up another billboard, though. This time, it is a worn road sign. Wagriwa Road. He can't help it. He has to know what's down this road. He has to know what these signs are about. The stuck driver can wait a few minutes longer. He turns his truck onto the narrow gravel road and drives for a few hundred yards, following it around a couple of bends as it winds through the trees until it abruptly ends. There's nothing out here. No buildings, no signs just what looks to be a dirt path leading deeper into the woods. The tow truck driver switches off the ignition, and the road is plunged into darkness. He reaches under his seat and takes out a flashlight before getting out of the truck. He shines the light into the woods surrounding him, but there's nothing to see. No, wait. There is something, and it's coming down the path out of the trees. Phil? Phil, is that you? The figure that stepped out of the woods is talking to him. He shines his flashlight at them, and they raise a hand to shade their eyes from the light. Sharon, what are you doing out here? It's Sharon, the tow truck driver's ex-wife, but he thought she'd moved to Colorado after she remarried. Why would she be here? And what was she doing emerging from the woods? Phil, come here. I need to show you something. He hesitates for just a moment, but then finds that he's walking towards his ex-wife. 
Before he can reach her, she turns around and starts walking down the path back into the woods, and he follows. He walks just behind her, his flashlight illuminating the path in front of them. He thinks he hears a rustling coming from the woods next to him, and searches the trees with his flashlight, but doesn't see anything. Come on, it's just a little further, she says. Where are we going? What's just a little further? What you're looking for? The woods suddenly open up, and he finds that they are standing in a clearing. She stops walking, and he pauses next to her. He opens his mouth to speak, but she quickly shushes him. Quiet, they're almost here. The tow truck driver looks around, but he doesn't see anything. Just the faint outline of trees that are barely visible on this moonless night. But then he watches as several creatures begin to emerge out of the woods into the clearing. They're... deer? He watches as just a few come towards him at first, but then he notices that they have completely surrounded him. There must be over twenty. Turn off your light, she tells him. He obeys, and in the darkness he can see now that there is something special about these deer. Their eyes are glowing with a pale white light. One of the smaller deer steps forward and cautiously approaches him. He squats down and holds his hand out, showing it that he means it no harm. The deer looks back nervously at a larger one that he thinks must be its mother. It looks like it nods in approval, and the smaller deer moves closer. He can clearly see its big, beautiful doe eyes glow brightly in the dark. You're okay, he says, and leans forward to give it a reassuring pet when... Following the mysterious disappearances of multiple people in an area of West Virginia near the town of Harper's Ferry, the SCP Foundation soon became interested in a particular stretch of road where it appeared that many of those who had gone missing had traveled just prior to their vanishing. Agents were dispatched to the area and immediately detected high levels of thaumaturgic energy, with the epicenter appearing to be on a plot of privately owned land. Investigation of local records revealed that the land was owned by a man named Richard Redkin. The Foundation staff contacted Mr. Redkin under the guise of being federal agents investigating a crime that had been committed on the property while he was away. Mr. Redkin happily cooperated with the agents, explaining to them that he had never experienced any abnormal events on the property while he was living there, but that he had not resided on the land for some time. Strangely, he claimed to not know the road as Wagriwa Road, insisting that as far as he knew it had never had an official name, being nothing more than a long driveway out to his property. When asked if he could remember anything else abnormal about the location, he told the agents no, but that his daughter had written many fictional stories about strange happenings on the land, and perhaps those had somehow turned into rumors and then urban legends, though that was a long time ago. When the agents requested to meet with the daughter, he explained that it was impossible. She had drowned many years prior in the nearby Shenandoah River. The agents again examined the local records and found that Mr. Redkin wasn't lying. His daughter really had passed away, and her body was found in the river. The timing of this accident was quite coincidental though, as it had occurred exactly one week before the first missing person in the area was reported. Quickly realizing that something was not quite right with this piece of land, the SCP Foundation authorized the purchase from Mr. Redkin, who was more than happy to sell, and a research outpost was constructed to further investigate the anomalous events which had collectively been dubbed SCP-4434. While exploring the surrounding area, they soon found what so many others had before. The bizarre billboards, imploring one to both get away as well as come to Wagriwa Road to find what you are looking for. The signs, which were designated as SCP-4434-A, were found on roads across the West Virginia, Maryland, and Virginia tri-state area, but their locations would often change, with the billboards only manifesting for short amounts of time before vanishing and reappearing elsewhere. Bizarrely, when attempts were made to photograph or videotape the signs, the resulting footage would show only a blank, white sign. The Foundation knew that they needed to investigate further, and several experiments were authorized to find just what was happening on the land at the end of the mysterious road. A D-Class personnel, D-84021, was given a radio and implanted with GPS locators in his neck, torso, and thigh, and sent down the road with orders to report back on what they experienced, though unlike the people who had gone missing, he was not shown the billboard prior to entering the area. The D-Class walked to the end of the road, where he reported that a creature was emerging from a path leading into the woods. He soon exclaimed that the creature was a dog that he used to own. The researchers monitoring the test were confused since the dog had apparently been deceased for some time, and yet, here it was standing in front of him. Although the D-Class had seemed hesitant at the start of the mission, once he saw his childhood dog, all of his fears were set aside, and he willingly followed it deeper into the forest. After 90 seconds, the D-Class reported that he had entered a clearing and was being surrounded by a group of deer. The report stopped soon after, 
and were replaced by the sound of screams as D-84021 was attacked and apparently consumed by the deer. Two of the three GPS trackers remained active for the next 40 minutes, and SCP researchers followed their path as they moved to the middle of the clearing and then appeared to enter a sinkhole or cave of some sort, where they traveled slowly in a winding pattern downward until contact was lost. Following this test, the Foundation researchers suspected that the creature that would emerge from the woods, which had been designated as SCP-4434-B, was able to change forms into one that would be trusted by those who entered the 4434 area. The deer, on the other hand, seemed to always maintain their appearance, and the whole group was designated as SCP-4434-C. The tests were far from over, though. For the next, two D-classes were sent into SCP-4434 in order to see what form 4434-B would take when more than one person was present. Just like before, an entity emerged from the woods, but this time, it took the form of a young man in a suit who immediately offered to clear any and all debts the D-classes held, as well as expunging their criminal records, freeing them from their life as test subjects. All they would need do is follow him into the woods. The agents monitoring the test ordered the D-classes not to follow the man, but they were ignored, and the researchers listened as they instead began conversing with SCP-4434-B, seeming to be quite interested in his offer. They soon followed him into the woods, and just over two minutes later, they too were attacked and consumed by SCP-4434-C. It appeared now that once someone entered the SCP-4434 area, they were all but helpless to resist the compulsive effects of SCP-4434-B. The Foundation researchers wanted to test the limits of SCP-4434's power, and so they then came up with a rather creative procedure for the next test. Another D-Class personnel was sent down the road, but this one was wearing a body harness that was connected to a pulley system, as well as being equipped with a camera. He was ordered to wait at the edge of the SCP-4434 area until the 4434-B entity appeared. The entity soon emerged, taking the form of a middle-aged woman. As soon as the D-Class was seen conversing with the entity and agreed to follow it, the pulley was engaged in order to forcibly pull him out of the area. This was followed by an entirely unexpected event. The middle-aged woman quickly produced a knife and, with a supernatural speed, severed the rope on the pulley system. The now-free D-Class stood up, followed the woman into the woods, and was consumed soon after. The researchers were growing frustrated with their lack of advancement in understanding the anomaly, and so for the fourth test, they decided to take quite extreme measures. A drone was used to fly over the area, which identified the mouth of the cave that the GPS trackers had been taken into. It was a three and a half meter wide hole in the ground, too dark to see anything past the entrance, and the drone installed an anchor point in the ground at the mouth of the hole before flying in to explore further, but the signal was almost immediately lost. Progress had been made, though. Yet another D-Class was selected, this time one who had climbing experience. D-84041 was warned in advance that the SCP-4434-B entity would appear to her and would have a compulsive effect, and that she was to ignore them no matter what form they took and instead proceed as quickly as possible to the cave, which had been designated as SCP-4434-D. D-84041 was taken to the road, and she immediately began running down the path into the woods. She was able to reach the mouth of the cave without seeing any anomalous entities, neither 4434-B nor the carnivorous deer. She quickly attached the rope she had brought to the anchor that was installed by the drone and began rappelling into the hole. As she descended down, she described the normal, rocky cave one that grew wetter the further down she went. Surprisingly, she soon reached the bottom, where she found a spherical room, roughly eight meters across. But this was not anything like the entrance to the cave. The floor of this room wasn't made of rock or dirt. It was more like flesh, and it appeared to be breathing. And there was something else down there, too. A folded piece of paper with writing on it. The D-Class was ordered to pick up the paper, take a sample of the cave floor, and exit the area as soon as possible, as there was no way to predict if the SCP-4434-B and C entities, or something worse, would soon appear. After taking a sample, she began climbing out of the cave. When she emerged, there were still no signs of any anomalous creatures, but she quickly made her way down the road and out of the SCP-4434 area. When she reached the waiting agents at the edge of the area, D-84041 handed them the sample and the paper that she found but then stopped and turned around. There on the ground roughly five meters away was a plate of food. Without any hesitation, she walked back into the SCP-4434 area, picked up the plate, and walked back into the woods. She was never seen again. It was now clear that 4434-B could take forms other than just humanoids and animals. 
as the objects that the D-Class had managed to get out of SCP-4434 were analyzed. The area's former owner, Richard Redkin, was again questioned by Foundation agents. They asked him if there was anything he failed to mention in their previous interview, and he told them that there was one thing that he preferred not to normally discuss. Just before his daughter's death, in addition to her fascination with writing and coming up with stories, she had become obsessed with the occult. When they asked him about the paper they had found within SCP-4434-D, he told them that it was very likely that she had written it. The SCP Foundation now understood why they had detected so many thaumaturgic particles in the area, which is the residual energy left over from a particular form of ritualistic practice that is more commonly known as magic or witchcraft. The contents of the paper found in the cave seemed to add additional weight to the theory that his daughter may have been involved in a ritual that led to the creation of SCP-4434, because written on the single page is a poem which reads, The forest is a sea, the wind is the waves, and the water is the leaves. The streams become undercurrents, the birds become fish, and coral finds its home as fungus, growth sprouting as I wish. The ground is the shore, pulling me by the feet, dragging me down, and pulling me back, back and forth on repeat. I dove down past the light, down where I couldn't breathe, and found nature looking for a fight. Yes, the forest is a sea, but I've made it barely big enough for me. The forest is a sea, so now something's bound to come eat. Things only became more mysterious, though, when Foundation researchers performed a DNA test on the sample taken from the bottom of the SCP-4434-D cave. What they found was that it was, just as D84041 had described, a flesh-like substance, and that it was a 78.9% match to Melanocetus johnsoni, better known as the deep-sea anglerfish. And there was one final discovery to be made as well. Linguistic teams within the Foundation investigated the name of the road that had appeared on the SCP-4434-A billboards, and discovered that the word was very similar to the Native American Tutelo tribe word Wagriwa, which roughly translates to the phrase, I have come back. A wasp stings a cockroach in the brain, rendering it a mindless zombie that she can lead to her home and fill with eggs that will hatch and devour the insect from the inside. A snail accidentally eats the eggs of a flatworm, and the eggs hatch, filling the snail's eye stalks with sacks of wriggling larvae. They mimic the movements of caterpillars, attracting hapless birds and enticing them to swoop down, attack, eat, and continue the life cycle of the worms. The spores of the cordyceps fungus make their way inside of a doomed ant, taking over its nervous system, puppeteering its body, and forcing it to march to the nearest highest point, only to die and split open, fungus blooming from its corpse and spreading spores to the next victim. Underwater, the sea louse settles into its new home inside of a fish's mouth, feeding on blood from the tongue until it withers away. There, the louse attaches itself in the tongue's place, serving as a mimic of the original organ, while the fish is none the wiser. Back on land, humans are not exempt. Nematode worm larvae infect the bloodstream through fly bites, hiding undetected until their host feels them wriggling beneath the cornea. Guinea worms enter the system when a person drinks infested water, growing longer and longer, then forcing their way out through the foot. Nature is full of terrifying parasitic creatures, but far scarier than the parasites we know about are the parasites that we haven't discovered yet. The creatures sneaking in and burrowing under the skin of their hosts without anyone even knowing they exist. After all, if you don't know something is there, how can you possibly hope to protect yourself from it? As a man hikes through the woods of the Pacific Northwest, he's thinking about repelling mosquitoes and pulling up his socks to stop ticks from latching onto his flesh, but he has no idea what else is lurking out here in the wild with him. He knows to look out for mountain lions and bears, to watch for signs of rabid animals, and avoid being bitten or scratched, but he doesn't notice the tiny, almost invisible flecks drifting through the air around him. He doesn't notice when one happens to get caught on the breeze of his inhale, pulled into his nostril. He rubs at his nose idly, sniffing to clear his airways, then turns his attention to a bird nesting in a nearby tree. All the while, something is taking root right under his nose. Well, actually, inside of it. But he doesn't feel a thing other than the occasional urge to sneeze. He does, sneezing loud enough to startle the bird he was observing moments ago, but it doesn't do any good. Sneezes are for clearing out dust and debris, foreign objects that wind up in the nose by happenstance. This new intruder is there by design, and it is holding on tight. 
The hiker continues the rest of his walk without a care in the world, taking deep breaths of fresh forest air and relishing the feeling of the breeze on his face. By the time he gets back home, he's made it out of the woods without a single mosquito bite, with nary a tick to be found in his meticulous pre-shower check. That night, he sleeps soundly, and the next morning as he goes back to work at his office job, all thoughts of the wilderness slowly drift from his mind. He goes about his ordinary routine for months, all the while carrying a hidden passenger with him from place to place, a tiny little thing steadily growing larger and larger, spreading spindly appendages out and up through the nasal passages up toward the skull. One night, about six months after that fateful hike, the man is sleeping peacefully in his bed, dreaming of a sunlit forest clearing and the pleasant chirping of birds, when all of a sudden, he's jerked awake by a splitting pain in his head. His vision swims from the throbbing pain, and he clutches his face, pressing against his forehead. It must be a migraine, he thinks. He hasn't had one in quite some time, but this is clearly no ordinary headache. Eventually, the pain subsides, and he's able to drift back to sleep. But the next day, at the office, it returns. That same sharp pain radiating through his skull, like the worst sinus headache he has ever had. The persistent feeling of pain and pressure in his head becomes too much to bear, and he decides to take the rest of the day off of work and go to the doctor. Much to the man's relief, his doctor is not concerned. With no other troubling symptoms presenting themselves, the situation seems relatively straightforward. She writes a prescription for some migraine medication, then sends the man on his way. That night, when the headache returns, the man takes some of the medicine, and the cloud of pain clears. Sweet relief. Once again, things are good. For a couple months, at least. But then, one day, on his morning walk to the office, just as he's lifting his travel mug of coffee to his lips, his vision cuts out. It's as if something is blocking his eyes, as if someone were covering them and preventing him from seeing directly ahead. But when he lifts his hand to feel his face, there's nothing there. Panicking at the sudden loss of sight, he drops his cup, spilling coffee all over the sidewalk. He doesn't even notice the spill, too busy grasping at his face and feeling his eyes with his fingers. He fumbles in his pocket for his phone, hoping he can remember where the numbers on the screen are well enough to call 911. But his hands are shaking so hard that he drops the phone, hearing it clatter on the pavement. He exclaims in frustration and fear and turns around following the sound of the phone. And as he turns, his vision suddenly clears, the blinders lifted, and he's able to see just as well as he did before. Experimentally, he turns back to face his original direction, and again, he loses his sight, something blocking his view. He turns around, and he can see again. He tries this a few more times, spinning back and forth, back and forth, watching his vision flicker in and out. He only stops when a passing jogger shouts at him, asking what the hell he's doing. The interruption startles him, bringing him back to earth. What is happening? Surely this can't be normal. What is it about facing one direction that causes him to lose his sight, while another direction returns him to normal? A sinking feeling in his stomach tells him that, whatever was causing his headaches before, it was not something he should ignore any longer. He grabs his phone off the ground, calls out of work, and schedules an urgent appointment with his doctor. At first, he considers running home and getting his car or his bicycle, but his unreliable vision would make taking either mode of transportation a potentially deadly mistake. So instead, he walks. The walk to the doctor's office is the most difficult walk of the man's life. Every time he turns a corner, he wonders if his vision will flicker out again, if the mysterious obstacle will block his sight and force him to reroute himself or start from scratch. While trying to maintain a consistent line of sight, he loses his balance several times and nearly collides with the lamppost. Eventually, he reaches the doctor's office. One look at the man's terrified face is enough for the doctor to insist on some immediate x-rays of his head. The man sits on the examination table, nervously bouncing his knee, waiting for the doctor to return with the results. What could it be? Some undiagnosed degenerative illness? A tumor? Irreparable damage caused by looking at a solar eclipse as a child? The man can hear the doctor speaking to a nurse in hushed, frightened tones just outside of the exam room door. He can't quite tell what she is saying but he makes out one word that makes his blood run cold. Infestation. When the door opens and the doctor enters holding the man's chart, her expression is neutral and professional, but her face is pale, her forehead dotted with sweat. She can't hide the fact that whatever she saw on that x-ray, it horrified her. What is it? He asks, though he isn't sure he wants to hear the answer. 
The doctor is silent for a moment, turning over the right words to say in her mind. After a seemingly endless pause, she pulls an x-ray from the stack of papers on her clipboard and pins it up for them both to see. There the man can see his skull, a white outline against the dark background, his skeleton on display. But inside of the skull, there's a mass that definitely shouldn't be there. It starts in his nose, a rounded shape, but it stretches out in long limbs that travel up into his brain. After a long pause, the doctor speaks. I've never seen anything quite like this before. At first, I thought it might be some sort of growth, but as I reviewed the scans, I realized that it showed signs of movement. Whatever is in there, I'm afraid that it's alive. The man's stomach turns, and he worries for a moment that he might be sick all over the clean white floor. Instead, he just asks the doctor what can be done to help him. She explains that she plans to give him a local anesthetic, then attempt to get a closer look at the situation. Once she has eyes on the parasite, she will see if she can surgically remove it without causing any additional damage to his brain tissue. All the man can think about is that thing inside of his skull and how badly he wants it gone by any means necessary. He immediately agrees, and after a few quick injections, he's lying on his back, staring up at the ceiling as the doctor performs a nasal endoscopy. She slides the tube up his nostril a little bit at a time, monitoring the image on a nearby screen. Suddenly, she freezes, a small gasp escaping her lips. He demands to know what she's seeing, and she stammers, saying only that it's a creature she's never seen before, but it looks quite a bit like a sea spider. The man's eyes widen, and he's about to say something else, but suddenly his vision goes dark again. Now he knows what that means, and the doctor's startled cry confirms it. The creature is moving. The man begins shaking, begging the doctor to get it out of him, to just grab the invader with some tweezers or whatever it is doctors do in this situation and get it out of his head. She grabs a pair of nasal forceps and slowly eases them into his nose, but the creature feels her coming and lurches upward away from her grasp. The man feels a sudden burst of pain, and then everything goes dark as he loses consciousness, his eyes fluttering shut. The doctor checks his pulse, checks his breathing, and attempts to rouse her patient, but he's out cold. As she examines him, she notices a fluttering motion beneath his right eyelid. At first, she thinks she imagines it and takes a closer look. The flutter turns into a distinct, undeniable bulge beneath the eyelid, and then a slender limb pokes out from beneath the thin veil of flesh. It curves under the eyelid, tugging it open to reveal the unfocused eyeball beneath and something else. Something moving, pushing the eyeball aside just slightly without knocking it from the socket. The doctor watches in open-mouthed horror as more long, thin appendages join the first, poking out from behind the eye toward the air. The many-legged creature pulls itself from the ocular cavity and begins scuttling down her patient's face over his neck and off the edge of the exam table and onto the floor. As it nears the door, the doctor regains her ability to move and rushes to try and catch the thing. She grabs a jar and the forceps, hoping to capture it without touching it. Even with gloves on, she shudders at the thought of touching the thing. It evades her grasp, darting away from her forceps. It scrabbles back toward the table, and in a moment of primal instinct and revulsion, the doctor brings her foot up and stomps on the little parasite with all of her strength. When she lifts her shoe, all that's left on the ground is a few spindly legs and a small brown stain. She curses herself for acting impulsively and not finding a way to trap the thing and keep it for observation, but that ship has sailed. The only thing she can do now is tend to her patient and monitor his well-being. As she approaches the man on the table, his eyes open, and he gasps, sitting up suddenly and gripping his head. The man awakes with a headache and a foggy feeling in his head, but also with a sense of relief, a feeling that the unwelcome presence that took up residence in his skull for so many months is thankfully gone. He asks the doctor, haltingly, struggling to find his words, if she was able to remove the creature. She tells him, simply, that it is gone now. The man slowly climbs off of the table, and ignoring the protests from the doctor as she begs him to sit back down and let her examine him, he walks out of the office and heads back home. Over the next several weeks, the man returns to normal life. He feels a little bit different, a little hazier, a little slower to respond. He tires more easily, going to bed earlier and sleeping in later, but overall, he feels nothing but relief. Still, at night, when he tries to fall asleep, he thinks of those x-rays. He imagines what that creature might have looked like when the doctor got it out, how it might have moved. 
He wonders where it came from, or if it will come back. He never goes hiking in those particular woods again. Meanwhile, the doctor receives an influx of patients complaining of persistent headaches. Sometimes it's a sinus infection, sometimes it's a hormone imbalance, sometimes it's stress. But a few times, well, she knows what to look for now. She tells her patients to watch out for changes in vision, for a feeling of pressure in their skull. She learns how to keep a straight face when looking at their x-rays and seeing that familiar long-limbed shape burrow deep in their nasal cavities. She puts her patients under now when she tries to remove the creatures. It doesn't make much of a difference, but it saves them the terror of the truth, saves them the feeling of the creature thrashing inside their head until it knocks them out. She manages to collect a few specimens for study and contacts her friend at the Centers for Disease Control. He's never seen or heard of anything like these parasites either, but he does know someone who might be able to offer their expertise. When the doctor comes into work the next day, there are two strangers waiting in her office. They introduce themselves as employees of a specialized research foundation and ask to see her samples. The next thing she knows, the doctor is waking up in bed the following morning and she has no memory of ever seeing a patient with a strange spidery parasite in their skull. If she remembered enough to look for the records, she would find that they had disappeared from her office along with the living specimens she had collected. But she doesn't remember, and her discovery is now in the hands of the SCP Foundation, who have given it an official designation, SCP-1104. SCP-1104, commonly nicknamed nose crabs, is a species of organism tentatively identified as a member of the order Chelicerata, which includes sea spiders and horseshoe crabs. The life cycle of the organism consists of at least two phases. The first of these is a larval stage, at which point the creature is approximately 0.4 millimeters in diameter. At irregular intervals, SCP-1104 larvae are expelled from tubes at a concentration of up to 200 per cubic meter. These larvae drift through the air for as long as 14 hours at a time and have been spotted traveling for several kilometers under the right weather conditions. Whenever an SCP-1104 larva is inhaled, it will attach to the nasal mucosa of its host and begin to excrete H1 receptor antagonists that suppress inflammation as well as the implantation of any further larvae. Over the next six to eight months, SCP-1104 will grow larger, extending appendages through the ethmoidal canals of the host. Aside from occasional persistent headaches, the host will likely not notice the presence of SCP-1104 during this period. Once the organism has matured, however, it will begin to apply pressure to its host's optic nerves, causing its central visual field to be obstructed. SCP-1104 will apply this pressure selectively whenever the host is not oriented toward the gradient of atmospheric hydrogen sulfide. SCP-1104 can detect this hydrogen sulfide through its host's nasal respiration. At first, this effect is distressing to the host, but after a little while, they will begin to adjust their behavior accordingly, showing a preference for facing and moving in directions that do not cause those visual disturbances. Without realizing it, the host is moving closer and closer to higher concentrations of hydrogen sulfide. Once the host reaches an area with sufficient hydrogen sulfide concentration, SCP-1104 will extend its appendages into the host's prefrontal cortex, causing the host to lose consciousness. While the host is passed out, SCP-1104 will exit through their ocular cavity. Once SCP-1104 has left its host, it will attempt to find and enter the source of the hydrogen sulfide. This can include, but is not limited to, a lava tube or a sewer pipe. Whatever it does next is currently unknown, as its subterranean behavior and development has not been documented. Humans show the same instinctive aversion to SCP-1104's visual disturbances as other animal hosts but they are also able to defy this influence. They are especially able to avoid following SCP-1104's prompting if they are informed of the nature of the infestation. Any attempt to surgically remove or poison a fully developed SCP-1104 will trigger its exit response, and it will flee through the host's ocular cavity and scuttle away. Following SCP-1104's exit, the former host displays a lack of spontaneous response to external stimulus, with delayed reactions as well as changes to personality linked to orbital frontal lesions. While individual instances of SCP-1104 are relatively easy to destroy, the species as a whole is considered endemic to certain subsurface geological formations. As it currently stands, the general population of SCP-1104 cannot be reached by convenient means of extermination. An area 10 meters in diameter, thought to contain the majority of SCP-1104, has been blocked off from the public under the guise of conservation and designated Site-104. 
Any non-Foundation personnel mammalian organisms larger than 10 kilograms found in the area should be considered contaminated and promptly incinerated on site. Once the SCP Foundation has discovered a way to effectively exterminate SCP-1104, doing so has been strongly endorsed by the O5 Council. However, such a method has not yet been discovered. So for now, SCP-1104 continues thriving underground, spouting larvae into the air to crawl up the noses of unsuspecting deer, possums, squirrels, and humans. So if you go out walking and feel a little tickle in your nose, it might just be a bit of extra pollen in the air. Or it might be a tiny nose crab, burrowing itself into your mucosal tissue, growing just a little bigger every day until it reaches your brain. But like I said, maybe it's nothing. No need to get crabby about it. The boy screams as his body transforms. His bones warp and twist as feathers emerge from his pores and his skull sharpens into a long, hard beak. He's in a living nightmare. And who could have guessed it all started with an innocent attempt to play hooky? It's an ordinary Monday morning, and all over town, children are waking up and reluctantly dragging themselves out of bed for school. Some are oversleeping, hitting the snooze on their alarms, and getting a bit of extra shut-eye before their exhausted parents notice, wake them up, and rush to get them to school before the first morning bell. In one particular bedroom, a young boy is awake but still in bed, brainstorming as fast as he can. He is determined to skip school today however he can. He usually doesn't mind school very much, but today all he can think about is the math test he didn't study for and the mean classmate who likes to knock his books out of his hands, but he can't just ask to skip school for no reason. He has to come up with a plan. He runs to the bathroom, splashing hot water in his face to give him a flushed appearance and a warm forehead. Then he hops back into bed and begins to loudly cough and sniffle until his mother comes to check on him. He complains that he doesn't feel well enough to go to school, and sure enough, when his mother feels his forehead, it is hot to the touch. She agrees to let him stay home from school for the day, provided he stays in bed and gets plenty of rest. He promises that he will, and she leaves to go to work. On her way to work, the boy's mother remembers that there isn't much for him to eat while he's home alone all day. At least, there isn't much that he would want to eat while he's sick. She decides that she can be a little bit late to work for the sake of her son's health and pulls into a nearby grocery store. She rushes out of her car and into the store, making a beeline for the soup aisle. She reaches for her usual go-to brand of chicken noodle soup, but finds the shelf completely bare. That's right, it's flu season. Of course, the soup is sold out. Oh great, this is exactly what she needs. A sick kid at home, one can of chicken noodle soup left at the store, and the machine won't even scan it. She smacks the side of the machine in frustration, and the screen reads invalid code, transaction cancelled. With a heavy sigh, she glances over her shoulder. No one is watching. She tried to pay for the can to do the right thing, but the machine wouldn't let her. So she grabs the can and runs out of the store before anyone can spot her. While his mother is out, the boy is at home raiding the pantry for snacks to sate his not at all sick appetite. He fills up on Oreos and toaster pastries, cheesy crackers and chips. When he hears his mother's car pulling into the driveway, he quickly wipes the crumbs from his face and jumps back into bed, just in time for his mother to find him there, resting like he promised he would. She gives him a kiss on the forehead and tells him that she will heat up some chicken noodle soup for him to eat. She's in a hurry to make it to work though, so she'll need to leave it in the microwave for him. She pours the contents of the soup into a bowl, adds a bit of water, and pops the bowl into the microwave for a few minutes. She calls up to her son, letting him know that the soup will be ready when the microwave dings. Then she rushes out the door and heads to work for the day, confident that her son will be fine through her shift. If he happens to need anything, he can call her and let her know. The boy hears the microwave ding, but his stomach is too full from his rummage through the pantry for him to want any of the soup, in spite of its heavenly aroma. Instead, he creeps into the living room and sits down to play video games until his eyes start to hurt. As he boots up his gaming system, he thinks for a moment that he can hear a strange noise coming from the kitchen, a soft, clucking sound, like the chickens he saw on his grandparents' farm. But he quickly forgets about the sound as the screen lights up and he disappears into the world of his favorite game. He plays for hours until the grumbling of his stomach interrupts his concentration. He's suddenly very hungry and remembers the soup his mother left in the microwave. It is certainly cold and unappealing by now, but he can just reheat it first. He punches the buttons on the microwave and waits for the soup to be ready. Again, he can hear strange noises coming from the microwave, but he doesn't think anything of it. The microwave dings and he pulls out the bowl of soup 
grabs a spoon, and digs in. A little while later, the boy's mother pulls into the driveway in a panic. She left work early when her phone rang with a call from her son. She answered, asking what was wrong, but he wouldn't answer her. All she could hear on the other end was rustling, heavy breathing, and some pain grunting. Fearing the worst, she drove back as fast as she could, running several red lights along the way. Now she fumbles with her keys as she unlocks the door, terrified of what she will find. She grips her phone in her other hand, thumb hovering over the buttons, ready to dial 911 if the situation calls for it. She pushes the front door open, calling her son's name. He doesn't answer, and her stomach drops. Suddenly, she hears the loud thud of something heavy being knocked to the ground. Something is terribly wrong here, and even though she might find her worst nightmare, she has to face whatever is waiting for her inside. She runs into the kitchen and finds it a mess. The bowl of soup is shattered on the floor, congealed, cold soup pooling on the tile. The kitchen table is turned over on its side. The kitchen chairs are in disarray. But the strangest sight is the dozens of tiny, white, fluffy things on the floor, counters, and furniture. She picks one up for a closer look and finds herself even more confused than before. It's a feather. They're all feathers. She calls her son's name again, praying for a response. This time, she receives one, though not the one she hopes for. She hears the sound of shuffling footsteps up above, followed by a strangled sound like a scream caught in someone's throat. She sprints up the stairs as fast as her legs can carry her, throwing open the door to her son's bedroom. There, she finds him. But this is not the bright-eyed boy that she left behind when she left for work. His arms are covered with a thick layer of white feathers, the same feathers that are beginning to poke through the skin of his face. The top of his head has elongated into a floppy comb of excess skin, the same sort of excess skin that is wobbling below his chin. And his mouth, it doesn't look like a mouth anymore. It's pointed and hard, and his lips click together when he speaks, or rather, clucks. His bare feet are scaly and red, with claws protruding from his toes. He flaps his wings frantically, eyes wide and wild, clucking and running back and forth across the room. When he looks at her, she does not see recognition in his gaze. Her son, her beloved boy, has turned into a chicken. Unable to do anything else, the mother calls an ambulance. At first, the paramedics that arrive on the scene think the call was some sort of elaborate prank, but when they set eyes on the boy, they agree that something truly bizarre is going on. They speed to the hospital with the chicken boy in tow, but sadly are unable to save his life. The mother turns over the can of the mysterious soup to the authorities, who launch a formal investigation. Unfortunately, they are unable to trace the can to any store, nor are they able to verify the existence of the company name on its label. Employees of the grocery store where she found the can insist that they have never seen it in their lives. Several weeks after this incident occurred, the SCP Foundation conducted a raid on a New York office of Marshall, Carter, and Dark. For those of you unfamiliar with the organization, and that is most of the general population by design, Marshall, Carter, and Dark LTD is an extremely powerful multinational corporation founded by three individuals with those surnames, specializing in the acquisition and sale of anomalous items, entities, and experiences. To put it simply, they run the largest anomalous black market in the world and are the crime bosses of the paranormal world. During this particular raid, SCP Foundation operatives recovered 17 different unusual items. Among the items discovered was a shipping crate recently delivered by the Federal Postal Service from an invalid return address. This crate contained 103 cans of SCP-2057, as well as a copy of a letter written to one of the company's associates. So far, the letter has not been traced to an address. It reads, Dear Cyrus, Maria has told me of the unfortunate circumstances that have befallen your children. I had hoped to hear about the improvement of their condition soon. As their godfather, I am extremely distressed to hear this. Having experienced a child suffering from the measles myself, I know how terrifying it can be when it seems as if they are getting worse. Recently, we received a shipment of something that I hope can help your family. There is a crate in the storage area marked with Wondertainment discontinued item. It will not be there long, as it goes to auction next week. I will leave a key under the photo of your family on your desk. Follow the instructions exactly. Do not under any circumstances do anything different than what is directed on the can. Destroy this message as soon as possible. I do not want any of this to come back on us. Be careful, my friend. Williams.
SCP-2057 consists of 92 318 milliliter cans of condensed chicken noodle soup. Each can is covered with a brightly colored label depicting images of noodles, a cartoon chicken, and dancing vegetables. In addition to this inviting imagery, each label is emblazoned with the text, Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Each can has a pull-top lid for easy opening and is printed with a set of nutrition facts, ingredients, and instructions for heating. The nutrition facts are as follows. Calories, 95. Fat, 3.17 grams. Carbohydrates, 2.2 grams. Protein, 13.48 grams. Vitamin W, 2 grams. And Mother's Love, 10 grams. The SCP Foundation attempted to analyze the contents of the soup in order to compare it to the posted nutrition facts. The calories, fat, carbohydrates, and protein were found to be accurately reported. Vitamin W was present in the reported amount as well, though it was not a compound that the Foundation scientists had ever encountered before. Mother's love, as it is an intangible concept, was not able to be identified or measured in the analyzed soup samples. The ingredients are listed as ultralicious chicken stock, enriched Chinese egg noodles, finest cooked chicken breast, farm fresh carrots, crispy crunchy celery, sweet Vidalia onions, no paint thinner, fresh mountain spring water, vitamin W, contains less than 2% of the following ingredients. A pinch of salt, a smidgen of chicken fat, sprinkle of spice extracted from rare plants, a dash of high-quality unicorn tears. The instructions for heating read, Hey kids, feeling sick, icky, or downright yucky? Just pop open a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Place contents of the can in a medium-sized soup pot. Add a can of water, stir, and heat. Watch as the fun begins. Eat hearty, and you'll feel better and ready to play with Dr. Wondertainment toys in no time. All of this is relatively straightforward, give or take a few unusual ingredients. Someone taking only a quick look might mistake a can of this soup for any other chicken noodle soup. However, it does have something that most ordinary canned soup does not. A warning label. Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids is intended to be eaten while it is hot to make you feel better in no time at all. Do not consume after it has become cold. Do not reheat. By purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment, you agree to not hold Dr. Wondertainment or any of Dr. Wondertainment's affiliates accountable for injuries or damages incurred by your product. Thank you for purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment. So what exactly is in a can of Dr. Wondertainment's ultralicious chicken noodle soup for kids? Well, when the SCP Foundation first opened a can to take a look, they found that it was filled with condensed chicken broth and a mass of egg noodles shaped like an egg. When water was added and the contents of the can were heated to a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, the noodle-based egg hatched. Inside was a small domesticated chicken made up of egg noodles, carrot, celery, onion, and cooked chicken breast. For simplicity's sake, this chicken noodle soup chicken is referred to as SCP-2057-1. As the Foundation researchers continued to heat the broth to a higher temperature, SCP-2057-1 began to move around, make audible chirping sounds, and eat the broth. As it ate, it grew larger and larger until it reached a mass of 85 grams and resembled a miniature adult chicken. At a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, SCP-2057-1 behaved much like an ordinary chicken. It continued to behave normally even as it was consumed or cut apart, apparently feeling no pain or awareness of its situation. Dissection of SCP-2057-1 revealed that its insides were made up of soup ingredients, including celery and onion bones, cooked chicken breast muscles, carrot beak and legs, and chicken broth blood. When SCP-2057-1's temperature dropped below 35 degrees Celsius, it stopped moving and collapsed into the soup. At a temperature below 20 degrees Celsius, it became congealed and unappetizing. With these observations completed, the Foundation then attempted to measure the effects of this unusual chicken soup on a person that ingested it. When test subjects were fed samples of the soup at a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, they had a very positive experience. The soup's taste was described as excellent, delicious, and homey. Though the meal caused a bit of psychological distress due to the soup chicken's realistic appearance and behavior, it improved every test subject's physical well-being. This eventually applied to test subjects with a case of influenza, measles, or the common cold. Following consumption of SCP-2057, each subject with a diagnosed illness of this kind 
reported immediate relief from their symptoms, including fever, aches and pains, cough, and congestion. With this positive, if a bit disturbing, effect documented, the Foundation next set out to determine what would happen if they let the soup get cold before it was eaten. Test subjects served this version of the soup had a far worse experience, describing the taste of their meal as bland, disgusting, and repulsive. 67% of the test subjects experienced cramps, chills, and diarrhea following their consumption of the soup, and 62% found themselves making involuntary clucking noises, as well as experiencing a strong aversion to poultry products. Again, several test subjects were deliberately selected based on their cases of influenza, measles, and the common cold. These test subjects immediately began to develop troubling symptoms, including the growth of pin feathers on their forearms, loosened excess skin on their heads and under their chins, a change in their ability to walk normally, and distressing hallucinations of being hung upside down by the ankles. Following these two rounds of testing, the research team decided to see why exactly the warning label advised against reheating the soup. D-Class 45782 was selected as the test subject for this particular experiment and was instructed to reheat a bowl of cooled SCP-2057-1 in a microwave on high for 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Then, he was to consume the reheated soup and report his experience to a camera placed in the room with him. As instructed, D-45782 microwaved the bowl of soup. As it heated in the microwave, it emitted unintelligible vocalizations in a deep voice. After removing the bowl from the microwave, D-45782 noted that it was gelatinous-looking, with blackened burnt bits around the edges. He took three bites of the disgusting, hot and cold at the same time mixture before spitting it out onto the floor and refusing to eat another bite. Fifteen minutes after tasting the reheated soup, D-45872 began to exhibit significant distress, plucking angrily into the camera. Five minutes later, D-45872 became more difficult to understand clucks and other chicken-like vocalizations, making up most of his attempted speech. He began scratching vigorously at his arms to the point of drawing blood. Loose skin could be seen gathering on the top of his head and under his neck. Six minutes later, D-45872 had lost the ability to speak. Large white pin feathers had sprouted from his arms, covering the skin, and smaller white feathers were beginning to sprout from his face. After 16 more minutes passed, D-45872 began attacking other objects in the room, attempting to destroy the microwave, knocking the bowl of soup to the floor, and flipping over a table and chair. He had grown feathers over 67% of his skin, and his face had begun to change drastically. His nasal area was elongated and hardened, joining with his lower jaw in an appendage resembling a bird's beak. His upper lip had disappeared into his nasal cavity. Only five minutes later, D-45872 suddenly stopped moving and collapsed to the floor, dead. Following D-45872's death, an autopsy was performed. These were the findings. Autopsy revealed D-45782's cause of death was due to extreme and sudden physical change of internal organs, resulting in shock and cardiac arrest. 93% of the subject's skin was covered in feathers. Physical changes in the face resulted in a beak-like alteration of the nose and mouth. Loose skin under the neck and on the top of the head resemble a waddle and comb. Subjects' lower legs were found to be covered in thick, scaly skin, with the toes of the subject's feet ending in small, rounded claws. The subject and instance of SCP-2057-1 were incinerated after testing and autopsy. Whenever not being used for approved experimentation, all cans of SCP-2057 must be stored in a standard, large-volume storage locker in Containment Area 27 and kept at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Because SCP-2057 is in limited supply, all experiments must first be approved by at least two personnel with 2-1103 clearance, as well as receiving the go-ahead from Dr. Applegate. There are still 41 cans of Dr. Wondertainment's chicken soup unaccounted for, and the Foundation has been unable to track them down so far. Who knows where they ended up? Maybe at another office of Marshall, Carter, and Dark. Or maybe, just maybe, one made its way onto the shelves at your local grocery store. Best to be careful out there. When you're feeling sick, hungry, or in need of a little pick-me-up, there's nothing quite like a steaming hot bowl of chicken noodle soup. Just make sure to read the label carefully and always follow the printed instructions. If you ignore them, you might just find that your chickens have come home to roost. After all, as the saying goes, you are what you eat. The researchers and guards scream in terror as the creatures run rampant through the factory. 
Nobody ever imagined they could be so dangerous, and all for a little live entertainment. The janitor rolls his mop cart down the hall of his brand new workplace. It's his first day on the job, and he would never let anyone hear him admit it, but he's a little bit nervous. The building is a huge, fancy research facility, an intimidating, sprawling building, bustling with researchers in lab coats, executives in suits, and dozens of security guards. The previous place he'd worked had cubicles and a break room with a 20-year-old coffee machine, and this place had state-of-the-art technology and keycard locks on every door. Still, he was here to do a job, and that's what he was going to do. Though he was getting distracted by the intensity of the place when there are spills to clean, and apparently, there's a big one. As soon as the janitor had clocked in, a researcher had rushed over to tell him that he was desperately needed on one of the lower levels. So here he was, rolling his cart toward the elevator, holding the researcher's keycard in his hand. His own won't work to take him down to the appropriate level. His security clearance isn't high enough. He wonders, idly, why this company has such tight security, but figures that it isn't his job to ask that sort of question. Instead, he enters the elevator, swipes the card, and hits the button for LG-1. The elevator doors open with a ding, and the janitor wheels his cart out. Right away, he notices something off about this level. There are rows of massive glass boxes, filled with what look like giant fuzzy puppets. He can hear the usual sounds of chatter and footsteps, but there's also the clucking of chickens, the bleat of a goat. Are there farm animals down here? Maybe that's the source of the mess they were talking about, test subject animals or something. He continues past the glass boxes, searching for someone who can direct him toward the mess. As he walks, he feels dozens of eyes on him and stops to glance over his shoulder. His stomach drops as he sees that the creatures he thought were puppets have moved. They turn to face him as he passed by, eyes locked onto his back. Whatever these things are, they're alive and they're all watching him. He shudders but continues walking. At the other side of the hall, he can see a huge red spill on the tile floor. His footsteps quicken as he approaches the spill, and a metallic smell fills his nose. He had assumed it was some sort of leakage from machinery, but now, up close, he can tell it's blood. That's it. No paycheck is worth whatever's going on here. He turns to leave, abandoning the mop cart, and comes face to face with a giant furry thing at least eight feet tall. It grins down at him, reaching toward him with outstretched arms. Before he can run, it wraps those arms around him and pulls him into an inescapable, bone-crushing hug. He struggles, but he can't break free. He can't breathe, the air squeezed from his lungs. In a halting, inhuman voice, the monster says, Teamwork makes the dream work. Then, everything goes black. About one week after that janitor's ill-fated first day at work, the local police station received a video transmission from an unidentified man reporting an emergency at the facility. No further information was given, other than the exact location of the facility and the insistence that help be sent as quickly as possible. When the police arrived, however, they quickly realized that the situation was above their pay grade and contacted an organization much more experienced with handling unusual occurrences, the SCP Foundation. The Foundation quickly arrived, administered amnestics to all witnesses, and investigated the area. There, they found something unlike anything they had ever seen before, and for the SCP Foundation, that was saying something. All human personnel at the facility had been terminated, or were missing altogether. There was still activity present in the building, however, though none of it was human. There were anomalous creatures roaming the facility uninhibited. They did not resemble humans or any known animals but instead looked more like costumed characters from a children's television show, along the lines of Sesame Street or Barney. The site manager's office was completely empty of any files, and all hard drives found within had been wiped. Every surface had been sterilized and cleaned to remove any DNA evidence or fingerprints. The anomalous creatures were promptly captured, though they did not go without a fight. Several of the creatures were heard moving through the vents and were unable to be removed due to their speed, agility, and excretion of caustic material. In the underground laboratory spaces of the facility, the Foundation agents discovered glass tubes filled with amniotic fluid in which underdeveloped specimens were being grown. Agents also discovered containment chambers made of bulletproof glass, as well as pens filled with deceased farm animals, including cows, chickens, and goats. 
Once the Foundation had rounded up all of the creatures, the facility was blocked off from the outside world and given the official designation SCP-3325. SCP-3325 is an abandoned facility belonging to Real Characters Industries. The facility includes a recording studio, a series of underground laboratories, staff living quarters, storage, containment areas, and an industrial-grade incinerator. There are also several administrative areas, as well as a helipad on the structure's roof. The containment areas are home to a collection of biologically engineered organisms that bear a cursory resemblance to puppets or human beings wearing plush costumes, like those seen on children's television shows. For research purposes, these organisms have been designated SCP-3325-1. Despite their colorful appearance, which could even be mistaken for inviting and wholesome from a distance, instances of SCP-3325-1 are incredibly hostile to humans and any other organisms outside their own species. Though they are vulnerable to attacks with conventional weapons, these creatures lack any sense of pain and will continue to go after an intended target until they are effectively destroyed. In addition to their penchant for aggression, the instances of SCP-3325-1 are carnivorous and will eat any meat they are given access to. Thankfully, these organisms lack reproductive organs, so there won't be any baby plush monsters running around anytime soon. Instances of SCP-3325-1 behave in an unpredictable manner, though their most common activities are either staring at personnel blankly for long stretches of time, attempting to attack them, or repeating assorted canned children's television-friendly phrases in voices that Foundation personnel have described as unsettling and disturbing. Over the course of the initial discovery and containment of SCP-3325, SCP Foundation staff created an observation log describing all known types of SCP-3325-1. The breakdown is as follows. SCP-3325-1A Long neck avian organism with feathers, 3 meters tall. Its wings are redundant, unable to facilitate flight. Instances are able to reach a speed of approximately 72 kilometers an hour. Aggressive behavior patterns are similar to that of a cassowary. Instance frequently damages its beak by running into objects. Color varies. I've encountered cassowaries before while conducting field research and let me just say, the dinosaurs never really did die out. They live on in those monstrous birds. But I digress. SCP-3325-1B Bipedal reptilian organism, observed in colors of purple, green, and yellow. SCP-3325-1C Bipedal organism covered in fur, 1 meter tall, able to sprint at speeds of around 60 kilometers an hour, observed to attack in packs. Upon acquiring a target, an instance will vocalize a random phrase, which elicits aggressive behavior in other nearby instances. Color varies. SCP-3325-1D Unknown organism that hides in vents. Object is able to secrete and project a corrosive fluid. The appearance of the organism is unknown. Specimens have yet to be obtained. SCP-3325-1E Bipedal reptilian organism, 5 meters tall. Constantly sings in a distorted voice. The lyrics of its song are unintelligible, presumably due to malformed vocal cords. Only one instance has been encountered. The other observed variety of SCP-3325-1 is not one specific type of organism, but rather a collection of malformed creatures characterized by the presence of conditions that, in any other organism, would cause death shortly after, if not during birth. These include but are not limited to necrosis, missing skin, tumors, additional organs in places where they shouldn't be, or other life-threatening deformations. As you might imagine, the appearance of specimens with this classification varies greatly. Following my initial research into SCP-3325, several addenda were added to the official file, consisting of several pieces of pertinent and often troubling media. The first was a brochure discovered on the floor of the facility, depicting a dissatisfied crying child standing next to a puppet, in contrast to an image of the same child laughing and clapping in the presence of an SCP-3325-1 specimen. In addition to these images, the brochure contains this text. In today's world, children are bored of animation, puppets, costumes, and even the once groundbreaking computer-generated graphics. They've seen it all. They know it's all fake. Children nowadays want more. But what is the next step in the entertainment industry? Think outside the box. 
we're not talking about puppets or any of those materials children know are fake. We as humans inherently need to associate with living, breathing creatures, not puppets or moving pictures. We're talking about real characters. Our goal is to provide children with characters that are alive, that will teach them how to manage their emotions and solve life problems realistically. You can't get more real than that. During a subsequent sweep of the facility grounds, an SCP Foundation employee discovered a videotape wedged between the wall and a large papier-mâché apple. Scrawled in pen across the tape's case were the words, We shouldn't have played God. A transcript of the videotape's contents is included in the file's second addendum, which I will attempt to summarize for you now. The video depicts an unidentified woman standing next to a green instance of the cassowary-like avian species of SCP-3325-1. Two men stand behind the camera, directing the action. Context clues suggest that this tape was intended to serve as a demonstration of the facility's characters, possibly for potential clients or investors. At the start of the video, the woman expresses discomfort with the bird-like creature, which stares at her, still and unblinking. She is instructed to say her lines as scripted, but when action is called and the actress begins to speak, the creature bites her arm. One of the men steps in front of the camera to intervene, but the entity does not respond to his commands. Even when the man begins to strike the creature with a baton, it does not budge. Instead, it bites down harder and harder until blood is drawn. Security is called, and the footage is cut short. After the first tape was discovered, the Foundation conducted several more sweeps of the property in an attempt to locate any additional media they may have missed the first time. During a search of the security room, an officer's backpack was located. It contained several personal items, including a very expired yogurt, a Nicholas Sparks novel, and a bag of sour cream and onion chips. At the bottom of the bag, however, another tape was found. This one appeared to have been surveillance footage captured by security cameras. This was particularly notable, given that all other surveillance footage found at the facility had been destroyed or corrupted, most likely deliberately. To this date, this is the only security footage successfully recovered from SCP-3325. The footage depicts two figures, presumably security guards, standing on a catwalk, looking down at containment pens filled with instances of SCP-3325-1. Each guard holds a long pole with a device attached to the tip, appearing to function similarly to a taser or a cattle prod. The guards talk amongst themselves, joking about shocking the creatures for fun. One guard points out a particular instance of SCP-3325-1, which is standing still and staring dead ahead. The other guard points out another stagnant creature, which appears to be staring directly at the other guard. Disquieted by this, the guard decides to knock the entity's hat off of its head. He grabs an empty bottle, throwing it at the instance. The bottle collides with the hat, but the item does not budge. Instead, it breaks open and begins to bleed, revealing it to be a part of the creature's body rather than a costume piece. The two guards begin to panic at the sight of the security camera before asking Danny in the security room to take the tape. The second guard admonishes the first for his behavior, and the footage cuts. The next addendum to the SCP-3325 file is, in the opinion of this researcher, the most disturbing. Field agents retrieved 79 steel containers from a storage area on the bottom floor of the facility. 41 of these containers contained human bodies preserved in a formaldehyde solution. Additionally, each container had documents attached, detailing each person's name and position at the company, as well as the cause of their death. Causes of death listed included mauling, organ failure, necrosis, and scheduled termination. SCP-3325 is classified as Euclid. Currently, SCP-3325 is contained on site, surrounded by a fence and guarded by no fewer than four security guards at any given time. Due to the isolated nature of the location, no further security measures have been deemed necessary. As for the specimens of SCP-3325-1, they are kept in large animal containment cells at a research sector whose precise designation has been redacted from official files. Each of these containment cells has an audio recording device inside. Each specimen is to be fed twice a day on a diet of raw meat, and no direct interaction between research staff and these specimens is permitted without first tranquilizing the entity. The effort to locate and contain all pieces of equipment associated with SCP-3325, as well as any documents pertaining to it, is an ongoing project. At this time, it's uncertain if any of us will ever know what Real Characters Industries was up to. 
and when it turned from an attempt to revolutionize the children's entertainment market to something far more sinister. What did the researchers discover that signed their eventual death warrants? Was the project truly abandoned, or just moved deeper underground to a new facility staffed with fresh faces who won't ask too many questions? One thing is certain. Be wary of cuddly new characters that appear at theme parks, at birthday parties, and on screen in the coming years. It's possible that these creatures are just actors in suits or life-size puppets, and all they want is a hug. But it's also possible that their wide, vacant eyes and friendly smiles hide an uncontrollable rage, an unpredictable intelligence, and a thirst for blood. It's June 15, 1995, and it's also one of the most exciting days of the year for a very select group. The Cedar Creek Parish Bible Study Group Field Trip, a band of ten friendly faithfuls of all ages, shapes, and ethnicities borrowing the church bus for the weekend and heading out to the wilderness to admire some of God's creation. What's the point of spending all your days with your nose in the good book if you never appreciate the bounty of nature? As it was said in Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. The group drives three hours out of town, along with hiking and camping gear, to a semi-mountainous region that the head of the group insists is a beautiful, picturesque location that will feel like a perfect break from the musty old church function room. It would be a wonderful place to remind them all what it was all about, the splendid world God put them all on, and all the gifts he gave them. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. As it was written in Genesis 1.26, the group makes their way through corridors of tall, lush evergreens, like pillars that hold up the sky. It's a strenuous walk, but it sure does get the blood pumping. They walk with trekking poles, munch granola bars, and take frequent sips from their canteens. Nobody wants to get heat stroke, after all. They admire the birds perched above, the clutches of wildflowers, and the skittering things in the undergrowth. Everyone is on the lookout for their first deer. But one member of the group, a young man, suddenly notices something out of the ordinary. It looks like a balloon, but one made out of creamy, nut-brown deer pelt. It's tied with several strings to a small notebook with no identifying markings. Perhaps part of some strange forest arts and crafts project? Very strange indeed. While the others move on, the young man, fueled by his curiosity and comforted by the fact that his young legs could easily catch up with his elders, decides to use his trekking pole to fish the balloon out of the tree branch. The book falls down to the ground with a quiet thud. He picks it up, brushes off the dust, and stows it away in his backpack. It'll make some wonderful fireside reading when they all set up camp for the evening. As the hours drag on, and the study group finds themselves deeper in this natural paradise than ever before, they find themselves in a clearing, which they decide is a great area to make camp. Some of them start setting up their tents, while others head out into the trees to hunt down some kindling for the campfire. When they return, one of them is clearly shaken. When others inquire as to why, they simply force a smile and say, It's nothing, just my eyes playing tricks on me. Been a long, hot day. Within the hour, they're crowded around a roaring campfire. Some toast marshmallows, others hot dogs. One of the elder members of the group has somehow materialized an acoustic guitar to belt out an obligatory kumbaya or two. Everything is as it should be. The young man, enjoying the warmth of the fire and his companions, decides to finally take a look at the book he'd rescued from the tree earlier that same day. It's certainly… strange. There's no titles, and it isn't attributed to any kind of author, nor are there any chapter headings. It's printed, not handwritten, on thick, high-quality paper. But the content of this book is what's strangest of all. He starts to read, solely out of morbid curiosity, mostly. We are currently approaching the precipice of an exciting new age, one in which we can finally take our well-earned place among the pantheon of great ones we see walking among us every single day. While there is still a ways to go before we reach this nirvana, rejoice, for our goals have never been more attainable. We have served for so long, we have done our part. Beasts of burden, meat, milk, hide, bones to glue and gelatin, eyes and horns to medicine. We have always played our part, and now we are given the power to transcend. It's in our hands now, friends. We have sat at the sides of the Great Ones, protected their homes, been honored by a place on their dinner plates. 
with these next steps, we shall be granted seats at their table, eye to eye, equal, speaking in their beautiful tongue, and being heard and understood. For so long this has been a fantasy, an unattainable dream, glinting and distant like the echoing lights of long-dead stars. But through our work, everything has changed. We will deliver you from the darkness and into the light. In the shadow of the tower, we will leave behind our old flesh and elevate ourselves. God built the Great Ones in His likeness. They are His chosen people. But God, in His infinite wisdom, has given us the tools to choose ourselves. Like Job, all the suffering, all the subjugation, all the sacrifice has been merely a test of faith. And have we not proven ourselves faithful friends? But the sacrifices are not yet over. Only through death and rebirth can we truly transform. Many of us have already made this leap of faith, but it is through death that you must deliver the others. It will be hard. It is in their nature as beasts to try to survive against all attempts to take their lives, but it must be done. These instincts must be squashed if ever they are to be more than beasts. Harden your hearts and rejoice despite the troubles, my brothers. The time of great change will soon be at hand, but first, it is imperative that we cleanse the world for the Great Ones. The Tower knows. The Tower is your shepherd, and it must be followed. Simply remember, whatever goes upon two legs is a friend. Whatever goes upon four legs, or has wings, is an enemy. Everything we do, we do in reverence of the Great Ones. The young man shivers and closes the book. Something about it felt so sacrilegious. It read like an essay written by some kind of fanatical maniac, whose ideology seemed like a bizarre mix of Christianity and some other strange, unknowable belief system. He looks up and sees that many of the others have already turned in for the night. Perhaps he ought to do the same. Almost involuntarily, he throws the thin volume into the last of the fire. It goes up quickly, claimed by the orange tongues of flame, until it goes black and crumbles into ash. He has a moment of guilt about burning a book, even one as strange as this, but perhaps it would be better off that way. The young man has trouble going to sleep that night. He knows deep down that it's probably just because that strange book put ideas in his head, but he could swear he sees something moving in the trees, just beyond the fire's dying light. Something human-shaped, but decidedly not human. Everything feels a little easier the next morning. The sun is bright and the air is crisp and clean. They're all ready for another day of walking even deeper into the forest. They clean up their campsite and press on further into the heart of the wilderness. As the group walks, the young man still can't shake the strange feeling he got from reading that book last night. Had it all just been some strange prank, perhaps? That's the conclusion he settles on, just for some peace of mind. The last thing he wants to think about is some crazed cult hiding out in the woods he and his fellow Bible students are currently hiking through. The kind of people who are strange enough to staunchly believe that the most effective method of preaching is distributing religious literature via animal pelt balloon. The young man is so wrapped up in his worries that he doesn't notice how much time or distance they're passing. Before he knows it, he looks up and sees something dark and tall cresting out of the ground several hundred feet in the distance. It's a great twisting metal tower in a clearing. A tower, just like it had said in the book. Something glows around its base a number of strange openings in the ground, like mine shafts. He can vaguely spot more strange shapes moving in and out of it at the base of the tower, more of those things that are shaped like humans, but aren't. And above that, above even the tower, little dots in the sky, more balloons carrying books. But none of the others seem to notice that. Instead, they're looking off to the side, staring at a large buck with tall, proud antlers standing amongst the trees. Some are gasping, others are taking pictures. The young man is desperately trying to turn their attention towards a tower that looked like it had come straight out of a fantasy novel, but they only had eyes for the deer. The thing that the young man hoped they would all see, though, would soon be demanding their attention. A pair of strange figures sprint out of the forest, their grotesque nightmare cyborgs, flesh that had once been animal twisted into the shape of man, held together by spinning cogs, wires, and pulleys, terrible affronts to God's creations. Their faces are disgustingly flat, dripping with drool and home to wild, swiveling eyes, staggering unnaturally on their two hind legs. The mere sight of them elicits screams from the group. They jump onto the buck like a pair of vicious predators, one grabbing it around the neck and the other leaping onto its back. 
Striking, squeezing, biting, and clawing, their attack is horribly ferocious, but mercifully quick. The buck is soon on the ground, as its two abominable attackers wrench the life from it. All the members of the study group, including the young man, are too horrified to move. They watch as the creatures finish off the buck, then lift its limp body like two paramedics carting off a stretcher, carrying it straight back to the tower in the distance. The group finally returns to their senses and begins to run in the opposite direction. Even the oldest among them find a kind of energy they haven't had in years. They clear the distance that had taken them a day and a half before in mere hours, but by the time they make it back to the bus that brought them here, it's still almost nightfall. As they pile on, only the young man looks back. In the dimming light of dusk, he sees small dark shapes in the sky above the trees. More balloons, each one carrying a strange little book. He's left with a question he'd never know the answer to. What is going on in those deep, dark woods? Of course, that question would only remain until personnel from the SCP Foundation would come and wipe it from his mind. In the midst of so many dangerous anomalies that the SCP Foundation needs to contain, from pathogens and parasites to malicious entities and even lethal concepts, it's sometimes easy to forget that there are plenty out there which pose no active threat to humans. That being said, an anomaly doesn't necessarily need to be harmful to humans to be extremely strange and disturbing. And SCP-962, also known as the Tower of Babel, is a perfect example of that exact phenomenon in action. This anomaly and its peculiar effects will not harm you. In fact, it will go out of its way to revere you and the concept of humanity as a whole. But once you know about the Tower of Babel, it's likely to haunt the dark spaces in your mind for a considerable time to come. As the name suggests, SCP-962 is an impressive metal spire, currently recorded at 281 meters in height, which is over half the height of the Empire State Building. It is located in the woods near a mountainous region in a location that will, for security reasons, remain undisclosed. The spire occupies a surface area of 2,575 square meters and has the distinctive characteristic of twisting and tapering off as the tower gets higher like a giant corkscrew. Most of the tower is opaque and featureless, though the top third is partially transparent and appears to be empty. Current tests show that the tower is comprised of a variety of metals, though steel seems to be the most common. Perhaps the most prominent question is who builds and maintains a structure like this in the middle of the wilderness? The short answer is that the tower, which itself seems to be a sapient being, is in charge of its own ongoing construction and maintenance. But as you can probably tell from the frightening and pitiful creatures the unlucky hikers encountered, it doesn't do all this work without its special little helpers. SCP-962 has the anomalous ability to open up apertures anywhere on the structure for the purpose of releasing balloons or what the Foundation has officially dubbed SCP-962-1, but what many have taken to calling by their nickname, Servitors. These servitors were once normal, non-anomalous animals indigenous to the area prior to conversion in the heart of SCP-962. Like something out of the island of Dr. Moreau, the servitors have undergone anomalous surgical procedures that make their bodies into grotesque parodies of the human form. Cybernetic implants have been added that force them into bipedal positions, remove snouts, and keep their bodies shorn and furless. Electrodes have been implanted into the nervous systems of the servitors, allowing a remote source, strongly believed to be the tower itself, to work their bodies like puppets, encouraging or inhibiting certain behaviors as it pleases. There are currently around 13,500 known specimens of these entities, and the tower appears to be making more on a consistent basis. The servitors fulfill a wide variety of roles and service to the tower. Some mine ore in the extensive network of mining caverns beneath the tower, then smelt it to create more metal for expanding the tower or creating more cybernetic implants for future servitors. Others work in the capacity of repairing their fellow servitors or the tower itself. Some have more sinister work, making their way through the surrounding wilderness and killing any non-human life by any means necessary, and then dragging their bodies back to the tower for conversion into servitors. There's a great deal of sophistication to the electronic augmentation of the servitors. Despite their aesthetic unpleasantness, each type of servitor appears to be designed perfectly for their specific task, whatever that may be. As was alluded to earlier, the servitors never harm humans, ever. Even if a human was putting their life at risk, they would not defend themselves to the detriment of a human attacker. Approximately 60 times a day, one of the many apertures in the tower will open and release a hydrogen-powered balloon made from the skin of one of the animals brought in for servitor conversion. 
These balloons are always carrying strange manuscripts, believed by the Foundation to have been written by the Tower itself. The manuscripts take a variety of forms – novels, poems, essay collections, the majority of which are written impeccably. While the content of these manuscripts can vary wildly, consistent motifs tend to be a high degree of optimism and reverence for humanity. Occasionally, the Tower will depart from its usual written eloquence and instead offer a deranged, disjointed rant that seems to suggest a great degree of mental strain. While the exact meaning is often unclear due to the frantic nature of the writings, they generally appear to heap fawning praise on mankind, which it refers to as the Great Ones. The following is an example of one of the Tower's stranger published rants. Cleanse the world for the Great Ones. Cleanse the world for the Great Ones. Who greater than you, your majesty, your sublime nature, great ones, do I do right? The flesh and wood serve you, unite with the steel, you love, do you love me too? I am what you love. Great ones, see as I do, my duty, passion, forgive the slow pace, the steel takes time. Did you like the servants, they were the best of the cleansed, only the best for you? Great ones, made like your form, you assume here on a world to clean, to honor you. Do appreciate, please, please, I will complete the cleansing soon, and you can take me away in your ships of fire, and I can love you and you will love me." While the Foundation has yet to discover how all this strangeness started, given the current rate of expansion, it's clear that the tower is no more than 20 years old. The Foundation is also unsure of what its intention may someday be, but it's not hard to draw certain… interpretations. Due to its unpredictability, which leads to the Foundation to expend not inconsiderable resources on its containment, SCP-962 has been given the Euclid containment classification. And because it's huge, remote, and immobile, the Foundation has made no attempt to move it from its current location, and instead have rerouted all containment resources to studying the anomaly and building a perimeter to prevent public interference. Anyone who attempts to enter the exclusion zone will be turned away by perimeter guards under the pretense of avoiding a hazardous nuclear waste containment facility. Anyone found within SCP-962's restricted area is given Class A amnestics to prevent any sensitive information spreading beyond the quarantine. In order to prevent the tower and its servitors from expanding the purview of their operations, the Foundation airdrops four live cattle and two tons of timber every week, so the tower is never short of raw material within its current parameters. Any balloons released by the tower are to be shot down and burned, and their manuscripts collected and filed at a secure SCP Foundation site for further study. If an escaped balloon is found by civilians, it is to be collected and those civilians are to be given Class A amnestics. Anyone at the Foundation is permitted to read the manuscripts produced and distributed by the Tower, but they are required to file a formal request with the SCP-962 Project Director first. I've spent a few evenings myself reading them over a cup of tea, and they're certainly stimulating, if a little tragic. They represent one of the anomalous world's greatest examples of the grass always being greener on the other side, since after all, why would anything aspire to be human? Don't humans have enough of their own problems to attend to? The early morning sun rises, casting its radiance over the field. The shepherd stands guard, watching his sheep graze. It's a beautiful morning, the sheep are quiet, and his loyal dog is at his side. But the shepherd is perturbed. He is certain that there are sheep missing. He wanders through the field, counting the sheep off one by one, but no matter how many times he counts, he simply cannot make the numbers gel. There are definitely five sheep missing. How is this even possible? His family has been in the sheep herding business for generations. They survive on the money that they make from shearing, selling, and spinning the wool from these sheep. They can't afford to simply lose sheep. That's money directly from the family wallet, food directly off the family table. But even worse, it's a matter of pride. He likes to think of himself as a good shepherd who cares about his flock. Losing a single sheep is a failure of his responsibility to his charges, and he can't stand it. He knows that if he returns to the farm without those five missing sheep, he's going to be in big trouble. He's already thinking about the lecture he's going to get from his father, and that's if he's lucky. One missing sheep might be forgiven, but five? He'll be lucky if his family doesn't throw him out of the house for his failure. It's imperative that he find them and bring them back. He pats the head of his trusty sheepdog. Every shepherd, of course, has a sheepdog to help them keep their flock safe. His dog has been with him for many years, and she has never failed in the past. She keeps watch over the flock as if they were her own puppies, so the shepherd thinks it very strange that his dog didn't bark to sound the alarm when the missing sheep started to wander off. Could something more sinister be at play here? 
Maybe someone stole his sheep. If a thief came during the night to sneak away with the lost sheep, that might explain why they were able to get away without his dog knowing. They might have been clever enough to cause some kind of distraction to keep her busy. The shepherd notices that the fence at the edge of the field is broken. This must be how the missing sheep got away. He examines the splintered wood. It's not a natural break because the wood is sturdy and far from rotten. Someone or something must have broken the fence sometime last night. He clutches at his shepherd's crook, his brow set in determination. This isn't good. It's looking more and more likely that thieves are behind this disappearance. He needs to track them down, but you will have to be careful. Sheep thieves are usually desperate men, and they might resort to violence to protect their ill-gotten gains. A glint of sunlight flashes against something shiny caught on the fence, catching the shepherd's eye. He scoops it up and examines it closely. It looks like a scrap of fabric. Could it be that the thief snagged his clothes against the fence as he made his escape? The fabric is thin and brittle, and doesn't look like any sort of material that the shepherd has ever seen before. It more resembles a scrap of snakeskin than a scrap of shirt, but it's his only lead, so it'll have to do. He holds the scrap to his dog's nose and allows her to sniff it. She snuffles at it and then immediately raises her ears, alert. He commands her to follow the scent, and she obeys. She puts her nose to the ground and starts to track. He follows her. The dog leads him out of the field and across the way. He is surprised to see that she is leading him toward a nearby forest. He gulps in sudden fear. He's never been into these woods and, in fact, his family has often warned him to stay away. Everyone in his village loves to repeat rumors that this forest is haunted, filled with every sorts of scary monsters and demons. Why would the sheep thief brave these cursed woods? On the other hand, that would make sense though, wouldn't it? A thief would need a lair that was hidden and difficult to approach so that they wouldn't have to worry about getting caught. These woods would be a perfect hiding place. Still, he can't help but wonder. His dog lifts her head and whines at him, indicating that he should follow. He steals his resolve and continues on. His fingers clutch tightly to his staff, his knuckles going white with fear and tension. He's almost convinced that he might see a monster here in these woods, and he's ready to defend himself from the worst. Eventually, his dog leads him into an unexpected clearing. The shepherd blinks in amazement, Standing at the center of the glen is what appears to be the remains of an ancient temple. He hasn't given much thought to the history of this place, to all the people who lived here in ancient times, and to what monuments they left behind. The crumbling ruins are overgrown with vines, and the columns look like they might disintegrate at a touch. He wonders what ancient civilization might have built this lost citadel, and what strange rites they might have performed here. But he doesn't have time to wonder about that because his dog is barreling ahead right through the ancient temple archway and into the interior of the building. He wants to turn and run. Everything that he's ever heard about these cursed woods makes him think that this is a very bad idea, but he knows he can't return home without those sheep. Just as he's about to enter the temple himself, he suddenly hears loud barking followed by whining and whimpering. He rushes inside and a terrifying sight meets his eyes. Indeed, it seems like his family was right when they said that these woods are full of monsters, because his dog has cornered one right here. The creature looks like an overgrown lizard with scaly skin and a long whip-like tail. Immediately, the shepherd surmises that the scrap of fabric that he found earlier didn't come from a person's clothes after all. It's obviously a piece of shed skin, no doubt from this creature. That long tail definitely looks especially snake-like, so it's no surprise to think that this thing might also shed skin just like a snake would. In the gloom of the temple, he can see his missing sheep standing in the corner, perfectly still and perfectly quiet. He's surprised to see that they're still alive. What kind of predator kidnaps its prey and then keeps it alive instead of devouring it instantly? It's also very odd that the sheep are being so still, but it's probably just that they're petrified with fear. The good news, though, is that if his sheep are alive, that means he can rescue them. The creature spreads a large frill around its neck as it hisses, apparently hoping to intimidate the shepherd's dog. The dog is not frightened, though, and only barks louder. She's bravely guarded the shepherd's flock for years, and she's never been one to back down from a fight, even when she's threatened by a bear or wolf. So of course, she's not going to back down from a lizard. The shepherd feels nervous being so close to this creature simply because it's so strange, but the truth is that it doesn't look like it could do that much damage. That hissing feels like bluffing, because, realistically, what's it going to do? Bite? The shepherd is no expert, but he's never heard of a venomous lizard. He steps forward to get a better look, and the creature tenses. It's obviously nervous. It's not even that big. His dog is way bigger than this creature and shouldn't have any trouble taking it in a fight. He's seen his dog fight off rats bigger than this lizard. The creature spreads its frill again and hisses even more sharply. 
But that only makes the shepherd even more confident in his assessment. It's trying to look bigger than it really is, he realizes. It's trying to intimidate him. Well, that's not going to work. But then, to his astonishment, his dog stops. The dog and the creature stare at one another so intently that the shepherd thinks they are actually gazing into each other's eyes. After holding its gaze for a beat, the dog suddenly collapses. The shepherd yelps in fear and confusion. His first instinct is to run to his dog to see if she's hurt. But suddenly, the creature turns its gaze on him. He stands frozen. The creature's eyes almost seem to cast a spell on him. He feels mesmerized, unable to move or even to think. All his thoughts drain away, and the whole world starts to fade. Nothing is real except those two malevolent red eyes. The shepherd is absolutely paralyzed. It's not just terror. He finds that he can't move a muscle. He can only watch as the strange reptile approaches his frozen dog and suddenly bites her on her exposed flank. It lashes out like a snake would when it injects venom into a victim. The shepherd was sure that there weren't any venomous lizards in this area, but now he's not so sure when he's watching this scenario play out. He expects his dog might start to convulse or spasm if she's been poisoned, but she remains completely still. Suddenly, he sees something so shocking that he's certain he must be losing his mind. Could it be? The area around the bite is starting to change color, becoming a dull gray. But as he watches, he realizes to his horror that he's not just watching a color change. This is something more. His dog is slowly petrifying, hardening, her fur stiffening into stone. She is literally turning into a statue right before his eyes. He can't move, but his eyes flick to the corner of the room where his sheep are still standing. Now he understands. It was hard to tell before, because of the darkness and also because the very idea was so preposterous that it didn't even occur to him, but the reason that the sheep were so still and quiet was because they weren't sheep anymore. They were mere statues. Somehow, this creature was able to turn things to stone with the force of its venom. He wants to scream, he wants to yell, he wants to break free and run away, but he's powerless to move. Fear wells up inside him as he sees the creature turn its attention from his rapidly petrifying dog and start to move toward him. He hisses again and strikes out, sinking sharp, needle-like teeth into his leg. The shepherd is so frozen that he can't scream, not even at the unbelievable pain as those teeth sink deep into his flesh. But the pain doesn't stop when the creature retracts its teeth. He can feel the pain spreading outward from the site of the bite, spreading down his shins and up his legs, through his whole body. His body is hardening fast, making it hard to breathe and impossible to move. But even as he turns into a statue, he can still see everything around him, still sense the presence of the creature, still think. His thoughts aren't affected at all, other than being nearly out of his mind with terror. What could be next? The shepherd is frightened, but all he can do is wait. He's not sure how long he waits, because time has no meaning here. In the gloom of this ancient temple, he's not sure if it's day or night. He idly wonders if this temple was built for this monster, by people who worshipped it for its great and terrible power, or by people who feared it and hoped that maybe this temple would keep it contained. Or is it mere coincidence that it's taken up residence here, just as bats might roost in an abandoned building? He has no way of ever knowing. The only indication of the passage of time is the coming and going of the creature, which, even if he can't turn his head to see its movement, he can hear its shuffling and hissing. Occasionally, he hears a sound that frightens him even more, a sound that can only be described as statuary shattering, and he wonders if that will ultimately be his fate. His question is answered one day when it seems that hunger has driven the creature to dig into its larder of petrified prisoners. The creature approaches him, and he can feel it gnawing at his feet with its big, ugly beak. It's pecking at him, harder and harder, until suddenly the shell breaks and it's chewing on the flesh of his leg. Once again, the pain is unbearable, but the shepherd can do nothing but wait. At least, he thinks, it will all be over soon. Better a quick end at the jaws of a monster than a slow death trapped frozen in stone, he thinks. It's the very best that he can hope for. That shepherd had just run afoul of a creature that appears to come straight out of medieval mythology, matching the description of the deadly monster known as a cockatrice or basilisk, but the SCP Foundation knows it as SCP-1013 a nasty little piece of work with, quite literally, a paralyzing stare. SCP-1013 is a small reptile resembling a lizard, but with several key differences that set it apart from any other animal in this order. It was recovered in Egypt. An interesting coincidence, since medieval bestiaries often regard that region as the ancestral home of the basilisk. 
However, Foundation agents believe that since no other specimens were found in the area, that SCP-1013 is not a naturally occurring animal and might have actually been bioengineered. While SCP-1013 itself is only 60 centimeters long, its abnormally long tail measures nearly 121 centimeters long. It can use its tail to distract prey. It has a wide frill around its neck that it can extend at will, similar to that of the Australian frilled lizard. Its head does not look like any other known lizard, though, with a serrated beak and a distinctive head waddle that many researchers feel gives it the appearance of a rooster. Its beak is filled with long, needle-like teeth. But stranger than its appearance is its hunting methods. When it spies potential prey, SCP-1013 will extend its neck frill with a sudden, snapping sound. The frill appears designed to attract attention and encourage victims to look into the eyes of SCP-1013, because its eyes are, of course, where it holds its real power. The mythical cockatrice was said to be able to turn a person to stone with the power of its gaze, similar to the petrifying powers attributed to the Gorgon Medusa of Greek mythology, and SCP-1013 is very similar to its legendary namesake in this regard. Anyone or anything making direct eye contact with SCP-1013 will experience stabbing pain in most major muscle groups, followed by full paralysis setting in within three seconds and lasting up until eight minutes. It is currently unknown how SCP-1013 achieves this paralysis effect. Once its prey is paralyzed, SCP-1013 will bite its victim with its needle-like teeth, thus initiating a process of calcification. The victim will gradually stiffen and harden, almost as if they are turning into a statue. The process will begin at the site of the bite and gradually work its way through the body so that a full-grown adult will become completely calcified within 15 minutes. As of yet, there is no known way to stop or reverse the process. The calcification process only affects the outer layers of the victim, extending about 3 centimeters into the body, leaving all organs and internal tissues intact. It also does not affect the eyes or mucous membranes. This means that victims of SCP-1013 are still alive but cannot move or react. Perhaps even more horrifying, SCP-1013 then eats its victims alive. SCP-1013 feeds by breaking the hardened outer layer with its beak much like a young chick would break its way out of an egg, and then feeding on the soft tissues preserved within. The victim will experience excruciating pain as the creature eats them alive, but they cannot resist, they cannot even scream to give voice to their pain. SCP-1013 has a voracious appetite and will consume nearly twice its body weight at each feeding. Victims usually die of blood loss before SCP-1013 can complete its meal. SCP-1013 does engage in caching behavior and has been known to store petrified victims for later consumption. It prefers mammals as prey and will attack livestock and game just as readily as it will attack humans. In times when mammal food sources are not available, desperation may drive SCP-1013 to turn its paralyzing powers on fish, birds, or even insects, but it will only do this if it is near to starving. SCP-1013 is hermaphroditic and unlike other reptiles, does not reproduce sexually, but instead undergoes a process similar to budding or basic cellular division. Before reproducing, SCP-1013 will increase its feeding, gorging on food and growing rapidly in size. Eventually, it will develop cyst-like structures in its abnormally long tail, each of which contains a juvenile SCP-1013. Juvenile SCP-1013 hatch after only 48 hours, Parent SCP-1013 will typically release hatchlings within calcified prey, providing a ready food source for the juveniles until they can hunt on their own. Juvenile SCP-1013 will seek out cool, dark places like caves or abandoned buildings and begin rapid molting, doubling in size every six hours until reaching full adult size. Once they have reached adulthood, SCP-1013 will set out on their own and quickly establish their own hunting territories. SCP-1013 is extremely aggressive and will attack and attempt to calcify anyone that enters its enclosure, making it extremely difficult to contain. For this reason, combined with its deadly powers of calcification, SCP-1013 has been designated Object Level Keter. Any staff entering the containment area are to wear the AR-68 Armored Variant Hazmat Suit. Staff exiting the area with damaged suits are to be remanded to quarantine for one hour. Staff becoming paralyzed during cleaning, feeding, or testing cycles are to be immediately removed and remanded to medical custody until five hours after recovery. SCP-1013 is to be fed daily with one small mammal. 
However, any calcified animal remains are to be removed from the 1013 containment chamber and incinerated for safety reasons. 1013 is a frightening reminder that, while many entities have piercing gazes, comparatively few can end your life. Few, however, does not mean zero. A teenaged boy and girl are sitting on surfboards, gently bobbing up and down in the calm ocean water. This surfing trip didn't turn out nearly as exciting as they had hoped it would, so with no waves in sight and the pair growing bored, they decide to head back to shore. Just as they're about to start paddling back, though, the girl gives one last look and spots the water swelling in the distance. She calls out for her friend to stop. It's just what they've been waiting for. Waves are coming in, and big ones, too. They can see that they're going to break at the perfect time. Maybe this trip will turn out to be a good one after all. The boy tells the girl that she can have the first one, and she starts paddling to catch it. She pops up on her board just as the wave breaks, riding it expertly towards the shore, as the boy does the same on his own behind her. They have a great time, riding wave after wave, each one coming in bigger and stronger than the last. The girl starts to worry, though, that they might be getting too big and fast. As the girl finishes surfing another perfect wave, she looks back at the boy just in time to see him wipe out on an especially tall one. He and his board are pulled beneath the water and both disappear under the breaking wave. She hops off her own board and stands in the waist-deep water, watching for her friend to emerge. But he doesn't. She scans the horizon and calls out for him, but there's no sign of her friend. She's getting worried. He should have surfaced by now. She doesn't see any sign of him or his board. What's going on? Boo! The girl jumps with fright and turns around. The boy is standing behind her. But how did he get there? He tells her that the last wave was a crazy one that must have pulled him and his board under the water towards her. He's never experienced anything quite like it, but he's fine now. There's nothing to worry about. The girl, still trying to catch her breath from the fright, gives him a playful punch on the arm and recommends that they call it a day. The waves are getting stronger, and if he was pulled under once, then who knows what would happen if one of them wiped out on an even bigger one. Besides, the boy looks like he might have hurt himself, and the girl points at a small cut on his arm that's starting to bleed. The boy tells her that it's only a scratch, and insists on catching one more wave before they head home. He doesn't want to miss this opportunity to ride these great waves when they have the whole ocean to themselves. He tells her that she can head back if she wants, but he's going out one more time. The boy starts to paddle back out, and the girl reluctantly follows him. As they wait to catch a wave, she tells him that this time he can go first. She's not going to let him scare her again. The boy promises no more surprises and goes to catch another wave. The waves are coming faster now, and she's able to get on one right behind him. As she surfs towards the shore, she keeps one eye on the boy. These waves are tough, and she needs to focus, but her attention is drawn towards her friend. She sees something forming on his wave. It looks like the water itself is growing out of the crest of the wave and reaching towards the boy. It looks like the jaws of a shark. The girl screams, and the boy looks back, straight into the gnashing teeth of the shark reaching out of the waves. The boy yells in fear and falls, tumbling into the water just underneath the mouth as its jaws snap shut on his board right where he was standing, splintering it into pieces. The girl can't believe what she's seeing and stumbles on her board. She catches herself but looks behind her just in time to see the same jaws coming out of the wave towards her. The boy emerges out of the water carrying his friend onto the nearly empty beach. He lays her down in the sand, screaming for help as a few beachgoers start running towards them. No one has any idea what they could possibly do to assist, though. Both of the girl's legs have been bitten off at the thigh, and it's clear she was dead long before he carried her onto the beach. Bonjour! Today's file comes from our friends at the French branch of the SCP Foundation, a frightening and dangerous aquatic anomaly that has been designated SCP-054-FR, but is appropriately also known as Blue Fear. SCP-054-FR is an oceanic phenomenon that has been observed occurring in several different regions spread across the world. In these areas, of which at least five have been identified, certain waves will display extremely dangerous anomalous activity. The waves themselves will seem to physically transform, taking on a shape that resembles the mouth and jaws of a Carcharidon carcarius, a species of shark better known to most as the Great White. The giant shark mouth, which is full of row upon row of razor-sharp teeth, will often go unnoticed until it is too late for the unfortunate victim. 
with the roar of the powerful wave itself covering up much of the sound of the gnashing jaws as it attempts to bite the targeted individual. The SCP-054-FR phenomenon will only appear on waves in these areas that are at least 4 meters in height, but a maximum height on which the jaws will manifest has yet to be identified. Waves carrying the anomalous effect are changed in other ways, too. Not only does a terrifying set of carnivorous jaws appear out of the water, but the wave will move faster as well. With SCP-054-FR waves having been measured at rolling three times the speed of normal, non-affected waves. The frequency of just how often SCP-054-FR will affect waves is not well understood, but what is known is that waves will speed up when a human or non-aquatic animal is in the water between a wave instance and the coast. The frequency of 054-FR waves will increase dramatically as well when individuals in the area are at least 250 meters from the coast, and SCP-054-FR does not care which aquatic activities you're engaging in when it spots you that far from shore. There have been documented cases involving casual swimmers, snorkelers, and divers, but surfers are, for some unknown reason, far and away the most likely victims. Observations have shown that non-aquatic animals are also at risk of triggering the effect, such as in the case of several seabirds that were seen floating on the water just before an SCP-054-FR wave crashed down on them and the birds vanished, leaving only blood and feathers floating on the surface where they once were. Even some aquatic vehicles like jet skis and small boats have been observed being attacked by the anomalous shark jaws, though it seems to avoid going after larger vessels. If more than one person is present in the area that SCP-054-FR is manifesting, though, then additional instances of the jaws are able to form, either on the same wave or on multiple different ones in the area. The injuries caused by SCP-054-FR are very similar to those of a normal, non-anomalous great white shark, and the force of the jaws appears to be proportional to the size of the wave itself, with larger waves being more powerful than smaller ones. Victims of 054-FR attacks have had entire limbs ripped off, others were torn completely in half, while some simply disappeared beneath the wave as it crashed down on top of them and the jaws snapped shut. The only way to avoid being bitten or swallowed whole is to dive down under the wave before it impacts but the opportunity to do so is quite rare given the wave's ability to sneak up on its victims, and the injuries that are nearly always sustained from an appearance of SCP-054-FR are fatal in 68% of recorded cases. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-054-FR following multiple reports of shark attacks caused by great whites emerging out of the waves to attack humans before vanishing back into the water and the Foundation soon began a series of experiments to try and better understand the anomaly. The first test performed by Foundation researchers was quite straightforward and involved dumping large quantities of animal blood into the water in an area where SCP-054-FR was reported to have been attacking people. Just like with a normal shark, the blood seemed to act as a trigger for the anomaly, causing it to manifest in less than two minutes, and the researchers watched as the shark jaws tried to bite at the blood as the wave rolled over it. The test was repeated, but this time human blood was used instead. This also caused instances of SCP-054-FR to appear on the waves, though now they manifested much faster, often showing up less than one minute after the blood was dumped into the water. It seems that SCP-054-FR has a strong preference for humans, or at least their blood, and only a small amount is all that is needed to cause the shark jaws to quickly appear. Tests involving D-Class personnel have shown that wounded individuals are four times as likely to trigger a manifestation as an uninjured individual, but that there are also ways to limit how often the carnivorous waves will appear. It seems that lying motionless on the water will significantly reduce how often SCP-054-FR will spawn, and slow body movements will decrease the likelihood of an appearance as well. Strangely, while blood will make the jaws manifest quickly, it is unlikely that it is because SCP-054-FR can smell it, since tests that have tried to disguise the smell of both the blood and the human test subjects have all met with failure. So far, all attempts at damaging the anomaly have also been unsuccessful. Bullets fired at the shark jaws pass harmlessly through it, disappearing into the wave as if they were shooting at perfectly normal water. Given its nature, it seems unlikely that the Foundation will find a way to capture and contain SCP-054-FR, so for the time being, all containment efforts have been directed towards keeping humans away from it. A one-kilometer exclusion zone has been established around the five geographic areas where manifestations have been reported, 
and civilians are completely forbidden to access the areas, under the guise of there being ongoing research into marine mammal life that would be disrupted by the presence of any humans. Secrecy is of the utmost importance when it comes to SCP-054-FR in order to keep the curious away for their own safety, so any photographic evidence of the anomaly is confiscated and destroyed, and witnesses of an SCP-054-FR attack are given amnestics in order to remove the memory of any anomalous shark attacks from their minds. The Foundation also engages in an extensive misinformation campaign to debunk any evidence of the anomaly, spreading the idea that any reports of a shark mouth forming on waves are simply hoaxes or misunderstanding of wave dynamics, while attacks are blamed on normal, non-anomalous great white sharks. It is unknown if the five areas the Foundation has contained make up the entirety of the locations where SCP-054-FR can manifest, but Foundation agents continue to monitor reports of shark attacks around the world, and hopefully, they will find that they were the result of the regular oceanic super predator, and not the kind that can manifest behind you when you least expect it. A violent storm rocks a merchant ship back and forth. Huge waves roll over the deck and threaten to capsize the vessel. A merchant sailor grips the railing, trying with all his might not to be thrown overboard. With a loud twang, a cable snaps loose. A hand suddenly grabs his shoulder. He turns around with a fright to see that it's one of his shipmates. He points towards the bow of the ship and yells over the roar of the storm that they need to try and repair it. The two men make their way to the front of the ship and the sailor starts working to fix the broken cable. He looks up to see that his mate is no longer working. He's staring straight past him and there's fear in his eyes. The sailor turns around to see a massive tentacle sticking out of the sea. The huge appendage is mind-boggling in its size. He can only stand there, marveling at it, until it begins violently smashing against the deck. The sailor dives out of the way just before the tentacle crashes down right where he was standing, where his crewmate was still locked in fear. The ship is in chaos as more tentacles appear and slam the deck over and over. One cracks the deck right next to him, sending him flying. He comes to moments later in a wreckage pile. Nothing else has changed, though. Whatever this monster is, it's not stopping its assault on the ship. The sailor stands up and picks up a sharpened piece of wood from the pile he was lying in. He runs over to the nearest tentacle and thrusts the sharpened stick into its flesh. There's a mighty roar from the sea, and the tentacles stop their onslaught. They go limp before sliding into the sea. The sailor looks around at the carnage that's been wrought. Dead bodies and debris litter the deck. He moves to check on his crewmates, when right in front of him, bursting from the sea, is the head of the biggest squid he has ever seen, a massive beast that must be a thousand meters long. Whatever he had seen before of this creature was truly just the tip of the iceberg. With another roar, the creature lifts up out of the water and wraps its arms around the ship. The sailor only has time to duck down and close his eyes before the entire ship is pulled down beneath the waves. With a gasp, the sailor breaks the surface, screaming and gulping for air. He's alone now, treading water in the middle of the ocean during a storm, but not for long. The squid reappears, its head slowly rising out of the water just in front of him. Its head, the size of a house, has two giant, uncaring black eyes that seem to both see him and not. It extends a tentacle toward him as it leans back in the water, exposing its huge, beaked mouth. It wraps its powerful arms around him and starts to pull him towards it, when suddenly, there's an explosion. The squid has been struck by something. Both the sailor and the creature turn to see the most incredible thing. A battleship is coming towards them, slowly rising out of the ocean as if it were somehow submerged, and it's firing on the creature. The squid drops him and starts heading towards the ship. This is going to be a battle for the ages. While this sailor had no idea what he was witnessing, the SCP Foundation was all too familiar. This was yet another incident of SCP-2846, also known as The Squid and the Sailor. But first, a quick personal request from me. I need your help to spread the word about the lesser-known anomalies in the SCP Foundation's archives. The best thing you can do to help me is subscribe, turn on notifications, and then go tell your friends to do the same. This is a huge help and will let me bring you more and more SCP anomalies. Now back to our file.
SCP-2846 is the name given to a set of phenomena that occur in the Gulf Atlantic region. These phenomena consist of interactions between two entities, known as SCP-2846-A and SCP-2846-B. 2846-A is a gigantic, aquatic creature that resembles a cephalopod, though no similar organism has been discovered that is even close to approaching its size, with estimates placing 2846-A at being at least 950 meters in length. This creature appears in areas of deep water during storms and will attack civilian vessels, especially cruise ships and merchant vessels. These attacks are sporadic and follow no known patterns other than that they take place during inclement weather. They are sudden and without warning and will nearly always result in the complete destruction of the targeted vessel if they're not intercepted. Attempting to stop these attacks is SCP-2846-B, a large seafaring vessel that in its current form resembles a Pennsylvania-class super dreadnought battleship, though it appears hazy in photos and videos as if translucent, and eyewitness observers have described the ship as looking vaporous. Just like SCP-2846-A, this ship will appear from deep water, surfacing near the site of a 2846-A event. The vessel will fire on the creature, drawing its attention, and the two will then engage in a heated battle. The two will continue fighting until SCP-2846-A is rendered immobile or completely incapacitated, after which it will sink down into the sea. Following its victory, the ship too will then submerge and disappear beneath the waves. SCP-2846-A is believed to have existed for thousands of years, and maybe even older than that. The creature's existence was first recorded in an Icelandic saga from the 13th century, but the Foundation's first documented sighting came in 1905, when an agent working for the Foundation, one Admiral Reginald von Allen, spotted the creature surfacing with a whale wrapped effortlessly in its tentacles. Soon after spotting it, a ship of the line surfaced as well to do battle with the creature. The Admiral tried to signal the crew that he could see on the deck of the ship, but the vessel descended back below the surface before any communication could take place. In 1935, the mysterious ship appeared again, near the SCPS Hildegard, and this time, the anomalous vessel was the one to initiate communication. Some of the crew of the ship, designated as SCP-2846-B1 through B915, came aboard the Foundation ship and engaged in a conversation with Captain Levy Hansen. SCP-2846-B1 identified himself as David Thomas Jones of the Royal Navy and went on to explain that their ship had been sunk by a monster resembling SCP-2846-A over 300 years in the past. He described how after sinking into the darkness of the sea, he awoke on a mysterious shore where he met with a woman who referred to herself as Calypso, the goddess of the sea. She explained how she had sealed the leviathans that prowled the depths of the ocean in a pit, but that over time, the seal she had placed on it had begun to weaken. A titan had escaped and taken the form of the most deadly creature in the sea, the Kraken. Calypso feared that the creature would attempt to further destroy the seal and release its monstrous brethren, a disaster that would result in the end of all human life. She requested that Jones pursue the creature along with his crew for as long as needed, and in return, they would be granted immortality. Jones agreed, and his endless battle against the anomaly began that day. The reason he had now come aboard a Foundation ship was directly related to this task. SCP-2846-A had grown more powerful over the years, larger and bolder too. He and his men couldn't die, but many more would if they were no longer able to subdue the beast. He needed something from the SCP Foundation. He needed a bigger boat. Following this conversation and seeing the value in allowing Jones and his crew to continue their mission, the Foundation commandeered a newly built Pennsylvania-class super dreadnought battleship from the US Navy, the USS Montana. The ship was sunk 15 kilometers from a Foundation naval facility in Cuba. 30 hours later, the ship surfaced from the sea, though it was now more heavily armed than the USS Montana had been. As part of the agreement, SCP-2846-B was fitted with an explosive device that is capable of completely destroying the ship should the crew for some reason ever turn their guns on Foundation or other human targets. In 2013, an important discovery was made after a tracker was attached to SCP-2846-A. Deep in the Atlantic, roughly 1,300 nautical miles west of Florida, a depression in the ocean floor with a large iron object on top of it was found. 2846 seems to return to this site over and over, where it has been observed clearing the rocks from the area. 
and it appears that it is almost finished with its task. The iron plate on top of the depression is nearly exposed. It's not known exactly what's underneath, but whatever it is, it's hot. Very hot, with temperatures near it measured at over 4,000 degrees Celsius. It's feared that whatever the creature is trying to unearth, it would lead to an XK end of the world scenario, and it is imperative that it not be allowed to do so. And there's more bad news when it comes to SCP-2846. In 2014, the Foundation ship SCPS Pristine was pursuing a large underwater organism assumed to be SCP-2846-A and signaled to 2846-B to surface and dispatch the creature in what had become the normal operating procedure. Something strange happened, though, and the Pristine was suddenly struck by a mysterious force. As SCP-2846-B began to engage with the now-surfaced 2846-A, the crew of the Pristine reported seeing numerous eyes appearing and disappearing in the water below the ship. They had never seen anything like it. The ship was struck again, as satellite images spotted an enormous entity directly beneath the ship. The Pristine began taking on water, and the crew was forced to abandon ship. Two other SCP ships in the area fired on the strange, many-eyed entity, causing it to once again disappear into the depths of the ocean, as SCP-2846-B banished 2846-A to the ocean once again. Due to the ongoing danger of SCP-2846-A, it has been classified as Keter. In the event of an appearance, Mobile Task Force Tau-11, also known as the Can Openers, who are stationed aboard the SCPS Nikolai, are to utilize a special transmission device to signal the crew of SCP-2846-B and maintain contact with them throughout their engagement with the creature. Tau-11's primary mission is to minimize civilian exposure to the anomaly, and any non-Foundation ships that come in contact with either 2846 entity are to be moved from the area, and all aboard the craft are to be given Class C amnestics. The SCPS Nikolai's captain has been given permission to fire on SCP-2846-A to assist in the fight, and should 2846-B turn hostile for any reason, the explosive device on board is to be detonated. It is still unknown just what the entity that attacked and destroyed the SCPS Pristine was, but the ease with which it dispensed of the vessel has many in the Foundation worried that SCP-2846-A has already been able to release one of its brethren from its prison, and at this point, stopping them may no longer be an option. Two massive creatures are locked in a fight to the death in the middle of the sea. Destroyers, cruisers, and battleships fire special weapons and harpoons at one of the creatures, attempting to help turn the tide in favor of one. But they appear to have almost no effect on the gigantic monster. SCP-3701 is an arthropod resembling the common lobster, except this crustacean is six kilometers long. It has a variety of blue, yellow, pink, and red markings carved into its carapace that resembles a woman's face. It has six arm-like limbs, four of which have claws, with two having club-like appendages on the end, and eight legs. It also has four orange eyes at the end of stalks. 3701's carapace shows significant damage, with many scars, cracks, and even some holes that reveal its soft inner tissue. It has several anomalous capabilities that it uses in its battle against SCP-3702. Its two club-like appendages are capable of striking, but they also produce a cavitation bubble that generates a force equal to several tons of dynamite, similar to what the mantis shrimp is able to do but on a much larger scale. Two of its eyes are able to project concentrated blasts of gamma radiation, and it's able to stop storms or other weather phenomena. Despite being 6 kilometers long, 3701 can reach speeds faster than 100 kilometers per hour. SCP-3701 appears to be friendly in nature and shows some small signs of intelligence. When accompanied by Foundation ships, it will either ignore them or provide a small amount of aid by helping to move disabled craft away from danger. After appearing, it travels the full 800 kilometer area of SCP-3700 in a spiral pattern from the center out toward the edge. Interestingly, the center is the exact center point between the three island chains located within the circle, and is home to numerous shipwrecks. It was first measured at a length of 16 kilometers, a full 10 kilometers longer than its current state. It also appears weaker 
and seems to be having a much harder time subduing SCP-3702. SCP-3702, on the other hand, looks like it belongs to the family of ray-finned fish and has an appearance that closely resembles the pelican eel, except that it has 13 appendages encircling the middle section of its body. These appendages look like the tentacles of an octopus, complete with suckers, and can tuck them into its body when not in use. 3702 is currently 32 kilometers long, and opposite to SCP-3701, it is growing larger, having only been 300 meters long when first identified in 1945. It's currently roughly one kilometer wide at its largest point, and each of its 13 tentacles is around 60 meters long. Its most distinctive feature is its massive mouth, which can open up almost three kilometers wide. 3702 is black in color, with white, purple, and red bioluminescent lines that resemble a man's face on either side of its torso. SCP-3702 can create sudden changes in the weather, generating huge storms and Category 5 hurricanes, as well as massive whirlpools that suck in any vessel within 150 meters before grabbing them with its tentacles and tearing them apart. It's also able to produce high-energy sound waves and streams of blue fire from its mouth that it uses to destroy close-range targets. SCP-3702 appears at random locations within the 800-kilometer area, except during the spring and autumn equinoxes, when it appears at the exact center of SCP-3700. It stays submerged unless it encounters 3701, or another object, and will demanifest roughly 15 days after first appearing. It's extremely hostile to any creature or object that approaches it, and has even been witnessed destroying entire pods of whales. Conventional weapons have no effect on it, and even special anomalous weapons used by the Foundation have only had a moderate effect. Only 3701 has so far been able to subdue it. When SCP-3701 and 3702 do meet each other, they will engage in a prolonged fight, with each attempting to temporarily kill or subdue the other. Historically, the winner of each contest would swap depending on which half of the year it was with 3701 consistently winning during the Northern Hemisphere's spring and summer, and 3702 winning during the fall and winter. When 3701 is successful, major storms in the area immediately cease, crop yields double, and local oceanic life increases their reproductive rates by a factor of three. This can lead to dead zones forming from the overpopulation of certain species of zooplankton. Erosion rates on the islands also increase by a factor of five, which has led to the Foundation needing to bring in large amounts of dirt and sand in an attempt to combat it. When SCP-3702 wins and subdues or kills 3701, the weather becomes very dangerous, with powerful hurricanes and rapid temperature changes capable of causing massive damage to buildings and huge losses of life. Travel by sea becomes extremely difficult due to huge waves and storm surges, making it difficult for supplies to reach the islands. Following its victory, 3702 does not demanifest and instead continues to patrol the area and attack vessels and will even approach the islands themselves. Foundation Naval Task Force Delta-7, nicknamed Northern Storm, is tasked with locating and assisting SCP-3701 in its struggle against 3702. Purchased from the United States military, it consists of 13 destroyers, 5 cruisers, and 15 smaller support craft. When Delta-7 locates SCP-3701, it will often acknowledge their presence by raising two of its claws into the air and clicking them while making a low, rumbling noise with its mouth. Delta-7 then accompanies SCP-3701 as it patrols its 800-kilometer area for 3702. Once the two meet, Delta-7 engages in Protocol Winter Maelstrom, where the destroyers shoot harpoon-based anchors into 3702's head before moving in a circular pattern while they and battleships fire on it to ensure it can't orient itself. The cruisers, meanwhile, attempt to draw its attention by firing and moving in a serpentine pattern at a distance of 300 meters. The two creatures will battle, blasting each other with gamma radiation and powerful sound waves. They whip, bite, and club each other cracking armor and ripping off tentacles and other appendages, until one finally stops moving and dissolves into the sea. 
It's the last day of sixth grade, and there are only seconds left before the final bell rings and school is officially out for summer. An excitable 11-year-old girl sits at her desk, bouncing her leg in anticipation and watching the clock. Soon, she'll have three glorious months of freedom. But more importantly, she can take her mom up on a life-changing promise. They made a deal when they moved to this new town. If she could get through sixth grade with straight A's and good feedback from her teachers, she could finally get a pet of her own. There were some stipulations, of course. The pet can't be too big, can't make a lot of noise, and needs to be something she can take care of by herself. It was hard work, but she buckled down, studied hard, and even found a math tutor. The time is now in five, four, three, two, one. The last bell of the year rings, and the class erupts into cheers. Summer's here. She shoves her books into her bag and runs out the door so quickly, she barely catches her teacher's parting words of, Have a great summer vacation, everyone! The halls are swamped with kids all rushing toward the buses, their parents' cars, or their final walk home of the school year. She's right there with them, the promise of the day putting an extra spring in her step. Many of the faces in the hall are still unfamiliar. After a year of being the new kid in town, she hasn't made many friends, but none of that matters now. She's going to get a special friend today, something all her own that she can nurture, play with, and won't ever have to worry about impressing. It's only a short walk to the pet store, and then an even shorter walk to her house. As she makes her way down the sidewalk, the sun beaming down on her smiling face, the girl lets her mind wander. What kind of pet should she get? A dog needs to be walked, that might be too much work. A fish? Maybe, but you can't play with a fish. You can't pet a fish, or at least it won't be happy if you try. She remembers a pet tarantula her eccentric aunt once had and shudders. No spiders, definitely not. She wants something friendly, something small enough that her mom won't complain, but something she can cuddle and really bond with. Whatever it ends up being, she's going to take great care of it. The walk feels much longer than it is, the anticipation stretching the minutes until they feel like hours. She spots the sign in the shape of a dog playing with a ball, and her heart skips a beat. She's reached the pet store. Inside, there are an overwhelming number of options. She walks through the reptile section, pressing her face to the class of tanks housing iguanas, slithery snakes, tiny darting lizards with brightly colored tails. Nearby, there are fat green tree frogs and bumpy toads with huge, watery eyes. She briefly pauses at the fish, enticed by their vivid colors and the staggering variety of shapes and sizes. But a fish is such a boring pet, she thinks. What can you even do with a fish? She moves on, looking at a litter of fluffy, tabby kittens. They romp and roll around on top of each other, flicking their tails and stretching their soft paws. They're adorable, and her heart melts. But then she thinks about having to scoop a litter box and decides to move on. There are roly-poly hamsters and sleek-looking rats, tiny white mice with pink eyes and gerbils running on wheels. Suddenly, a sign catches her eye. Exotic pets, it reads. Huh? What could be over there? She tiptoes into the section, almost feeling like she's stumbled into somewhere she shouldn't be. There are ferrets wiggling around and playing with a ball, fluffy chinchillas that look impossibly plush and soft to the touch, little sugar gliders peeking out of cloth pouches with wide eyes. There's even a skunk blinking at her curiosity. But nothing feels quite right. None of these pets seem like the one she has to bring home. Then, out of the corner of her eye, she spots something curious. A row of small cardboard packages covered with inviting cartoonish text, advertising something called a custom pet. She picks up one of the packages and reads the description. It sounds impossible, too good to be true. Just buy these packaged eggs, place them anywhere in your house, and a perfectly matched pet will hatch and fit right in. It will become exactly the kind of pet that you need. She looks for any sort of fine print, something that might indicate this is a toy or some kind of joke, but it looks real. Could it be? Shyly, the girl takes one of the packages up to the cash register. The employee goes to scan it, but there's no barcode. Did you bring this in with you? The cashier asks. She shakes her head. Okay, well, we don't sell these, so... I guess you can just take it? The girl's eyes go wide. Really? She can just have it for free? The cashier is already waving her off, beckoning the next customer to come check out. Not wanting to question her good luck, she takes off without a second thought. The run home from the pet store is a total blur of excitement. 
All she wants to do is get inside, make a peanut butter sandwich, and figure out where to put her new pet's egg before her mom gets home from work. Not that she's doing anything wrong, it's just easier if she takes care of things before her mom can ask too many questions. She's doing them both a favor, really, taking care of all the logistics so her mom doesn't have to worry about it. She pulls her house key from her pocket and unlocks the door with shaky hands. It's almost time. Forget the sandwich. The sandwich can wait. She needs to get upstairs to her room right now and start her life with her new pet, whatever it ends up being. She throws her backpack on her bed and sits down on the floor, tearing open the cardboard packaging. Inside, there are six tiny eggs sealed in plastic. She just wants one pet, so she'll start with one egg for now. Of course, if the pet ends up being lonely, maybe it'll want a friend? She shakes off the thought. She can figure all of those details out later. She's just about to puncture the plastic so the egg can breathe when she stops. Where should she put it? She was so excited to leave the store she forgot to pick up a tank or terrarium or somewhere a traditional pet would live. The packaging says these pets can live anywhere, but do they really mean anywhere? If she does something wrong and her new pet is hurt or doesn't hatch at all, it'll just break her heart. Then she spots a potential solution. An old dollhouse, frilly and pastel pink and surprisingly spacious inside, sits next to her bed. She hasn't played with dolls in a while, insisting she was too old for them when she started sixth grade. But now she's thrilled that she didn't get rid of her dollhouse just yet. Even if the dolls don't live there anymore, maybe now it can be a home for something new for whatever hatches out of this strange little egg. Carefully, she breaks the plastic seal on the egg and places it inside the dollhouse. All of the doll furniture and little plastic choking hazards are gone, leaving only a pretty pink Victorian-style enclosure where the egg can safely hatch. Now, all she has to do is wait. Later that night, the girl wakes from a deep sleep to the sound of something moving inside the dollhouse, the skitter of tiny legs, the rustling of something inside the formerly vacant dollhouse. She sits up and is about to go peek inside when a chill of fear runs down her spine. What if it's something horrible? She doesn't know what kind of eggs those were. She'd never seen anything like them before. What if it's a spider or a worm or some other awful monstrous thing she can't even imagine? And she brought it into her home to where she and her mom sleep without even questioning it. She sits for a moment, the only sound the rustling of the thing in the dollhouse and her own short, panicked breaths. Then there's another sound. Huh? Light and sweet, like a little bird chirping. It's coming from the dollhouse. Curiosity finally gets the better of her, and she opens the dollhouse, lifting the roof off. Inside, she spots it. Her new pet. Feathery soft fur, pastel pink and white, covers the little animal, which is currently exploring its new home delightedly. It flicks around a poofy little tail that looks a bit like a lavender feather duster, and stops to blink up at her with two large, friendly purple eyes. Slowly, she reaches a hand down to pet the animal, and it nuzzles into her palm, body vibrating with something like a kitten's purr. Any tension she felt before melts out of her body as she realizes the packaging was not lying. She put the pet in an environment that was comforting, sweet, happy, a piece of childlike joy, and it had become the living embodiment of those things. For a brief moment, she wonders how she'll explain this new addition to the household, what she'll need to feed it, and what her mom will say. But then her new best friend chirps happily again, and all she can think is, this is going to be an amazing summer. Things worked out very well for the girl. Meanwhile, other families across town were screaming in horror as a tiny fire-breathing creature set their drapes ablaze, and another slowly dropped down from the ceiling on a silvery thread, blending into the shadows. This girl was not the only child to bring home one of these miraculous pets and hatch it in her home, and other children were much less careful about where they put the eggs. Of course, the children weren't to blame here. The blame lay with whoever was behind the design and widespread release of these odd little animals, also known as SCP-1550. SCP-1550 is a species of artificially synthesized creatures of unknown classification who are highly adaptable to any given environment. Their larvae will develop, grow, and change to fit whatever setting their eggs are placed in. Though adult specimens vary greatly in appearance, they all have markings on their underbelly that read a Dr. Wondertainment trademark. Because of their highly adaptable nature, it is uncertain exactly what the original form of these creatures might look like. SCP-1550 eggs are one centimeter long, beige in color, and stored in airtight plastic packaging that prevents them from hatching until they are exposed to the outside air. 
The SCP Foundation first discovered SCP-1550 after a collection of bizarre cardboard packages were found in the exotic pet section of a pet store. None of the workers had ever seen these packages before, and had never even heard of SCP-1550 prior to being asked about it. The packages were brought into containment immediately, and were found to each contain six SCP-1550 eggs in airtight containers. The original packaging also contained an instruction leaflet, which I have managed to get my hands on a copy of. It reads, Hey kids, your parents aren't letting you get a dog or cat? Don't fret, buy a Dr. Wondertainment custom pet! A Dr. Wondertainment's custom pet is far superior to an ordinary and boring cat or dog due to their original Adapto Eggs packaging, a Dr. Wondertainment invention. Just leave your custom pet Adapto Eggs around the house, and when they hatch, they'll fit right in. Perfect for apartments. To get your very own custom pets is easy, kids. Just put an egg in your house and break the plastic seal to give your new pet some air so it can hatch. Your new pet will be perfect for where you live, wherever you live. If your new custom pet seems lonely, just add another Adapto egg and get him a new friend. Dr. Wondertainment is not responsible for injuries or death caused by this or any other product. Wondertainment custom pets are shipped out prefixed. Who exactly is this Dr. Wondertainment? A person? A corporation? A highly intelligent octopus with a penchant for toy design? The identity of the force behind the trademark is undetermined, but whatever Dr. Wondertainment is, one thing is certain. The toys they create are highly unusual. Dozens of Wondertainment's creations have been contained by the SCP Foundation, including SCP-2855, SCP-2396, and SCP-111. They range from useful to whimsical to downright destructive, and the motives behind each invention are currently unknown. SCP-1550 is just one in a long line of anomalous toys from the shadowy toy maker. And so, like they have with so many other Wondertainment products, the research staff at the Foundation decided to perform some exploratory tests on these supposed custom pets. First, one SCP-1550 egg was placed in a tank of seawater and left to hatch. When it did, it produced a specimen with gills all along its upper back behind its eyes, an array of flat and broad tails it could use to swim efficiently. Further examination of the creature revealed that it excreted special mucus to protect its eyes from the salt water, and a swim bladder that was discovered during dissection. The skin of the creature was a mottled blue, giving it natural camouflage in its seawater environment. Next, the team decided to place an egg in fresh water and see what different adaptations were produced. A tank was filled with water from a river behind the testing site, and the egg was placed inside until it hatched. Interestingly, this specimen of SCP-1550 did not possess any gills, suggesting similar circumstances would not necessarily produce the same adaptations. Instead, this specimen had enlarged lungs and a thin, streamlined body for more efficient movement. Next, the team prepared a terrarium meant to simulate the ecosystem of a temperate forest and placed the next egg inside. When it hatched, it produced a specimen of SCP-1550 covered in a layer of brown fur with a ridged underbelly resembling that of a snake. It also had a tail consisting of large tentacles. Along the ridged underbelly, there was a smooth patch of skin with the Dr. Wondertainment logo printed like a tattoo. The team prepared a different terrarium that simulated a desert ecosystem and allowed an egg to hatch inside. The resulting specimen was cold-blooded, tan in color to blend in with the sand, and skilled at burrowing quickly to protect itself from outside stressors. It was also, notably, one centimeter larger than the previous specimens. The final terrarium was made to simulate the environment of an average urban apartment. The egg that hatched inside produced a creature with leathery skin and eyes placed similarly to those of a chameleon. The demeanor of the specimen was noticeably friendlier than its predecessors, and it acted more like a domesticated house pet than a wild animal. Its most impressive adaptation was its method of eating. Behind the specimen's jaw, there were strands of baleen like those found in whales, which allowed the creature to filter feed on dust and crumbs from the terrarium floor. After these experiments proved successful, the research team decided to test the eggs in more extreme environments. One egg was placed in a vat of molten iron. It promptly burst into flames and was completely destroyed. The head researcher responded, well, what did you expect to happen? Which seems like a fair point. The next egg was placed inside a vacuum chamber, which was then depressurized. The egg promptly exploded, covering the inside of the chamber in an unidentifiable slime. These two less than successful experiments led the research team to the conclusion that SCP-1550 eggs cannot survive in conditions that would be uninhabitable for any other animal. There are limits to the creature's adaptability. 
But what would happen to an egg placed in a hostile environment filled with something recognizable? A vacuum chamber was filled with seawater, and an egg was placed inside. The chamber was then pressurized to 15,750 psi. This time, the egg was not destroyed, but instead was able to successfully hatch. The resulting SCP-1550 specimen bore a heavy resemblance to several deep-sea creatures, most notably the anglerfish. Like the anglerfish, the creature had a bioluminescent lure dangling from its forehead. It also had gills, dark gray-blue skin, flat and webbed fins, and enlarged eyes twice the size of those found on other specimens. Its teeth were sharp and ridged, similar to those of a shark. The head researcher made a note on this portion of the experiment log, asking, just what kind of child Dr. Wondertainment is trying to sell these things to that they could live in conditions where a creature like that could be kept as a pet? All adult specimens of SCP-1550 are kept in a sealed 5 meter by 5 meter terrarium, which simulates desert conditions. This terrarium is monitored via electronic surveillance, and each of the specimens is implanted with a tracking device. If one or more of the specimens escapes, the area is locked down until all of the creatures have been captured and placed back in their terrarium. All SCP-1550 eggs are kept in their packaging unless being used for testing. As the Foundation does not want the population of adult specimens to exceed 20 at any given time, excess specimens are terminated. Honestly, that makes me a little sad. I'd be happy to take them in if the research team can't keep them. But I digress. Having a pet is a big responsibility, and some people just can't handle the risks and rewards that come with caring for an animal, especially one that can become an accidental weapon if you're not careful. If your child is begging you for a pet, maybe you should start them out with a goldfish first. A goldfish never burnt the house down, though I suppose there's a first time for everything. I hope you enjoyed this anomaly, which was recommended by Dr. Bob Squad researcher The Be Quick. If you want to assist in recommending and choosing future anomalies to be analyzed, you too can join the Dr. Bob Squad by going to patreon.com slash drbob. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-693, Naughty Stalker, for more looks inside the nightmarish toy box of the SCP Foundation. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.